All right, Brother Gian, this is take two on our interview. We had some technical difficulties, but we are going to push through this time. So uh, we're going to start from the top once again, and uh, this is my my guest, um, as I promised, Gian the Baptist. And um, I mentioned this the first time that we spoke, and that is that I have been butchering the channel name, the play on the channel name. That is that it's supposed to be John the Baptist. I've been uh, pronouncing it, I guess, the correct way, but it's, it's, it's John the Baptist. Is that right? Yeah, well, you, you've been cor- uh, pronouncing it correctly as far as how my name is actually pronounced. But as far as the play on words, yeah, it's supposed to be, I guess, John the Baptist. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Well, let's begin. For those that don't know you, let's start, um, as we said, from the top, if you don't mind, uh, just telling telling everyone about uh, who is Brother Gia, John the Baptist. Who is, uh, let, me, let me try that one more time. Who is John the Baptist? So John the Baptist, okay, I'm 33 years old, I'm married with two small children, I'm not a pastor, though some people uh, might assume that, and some people have questions about that, I'm not a pastor, I'm a layman, but I have been um, entrusted with ministry as far as the Spanish side of my local church, where I take care of the preaching and the teaching there, and as far as my YouTube channel, uh, it was really birthed out of a desire to have more independent Baptist content out there. Um, independent Baptist content that specifically would be historically grounded, that would be theologically robust, because really there's a dearth of independent Baptist content on the internet. Uh, There's little available, and the little that is available is usually going to be from the fringes. Uh, And usually these fringe groups don't really have any awareness or regard at all for systematic theology or historical orthodoxy or any of those things. So um, that's kind of the perspective I want to come from as an independent Baptist. And so that is what my channel is really about. And a lot of that entails the doctrine of the Trinity. Right, right. Yeah. Now, as everyone expected, and we um, uh, kind of gave uh, a little bit of a taste uh, of the, the, the topic, uh, we're going to be talking about the Trinity today, the doctrine of the Trinity and there's a few reasons why. Number one, it's it has become kind of a hot topic again as of late. There's been quite a few controversies, uh, uh, not not including controversies in the early church here in the 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 latter church, you might say. There's been yeah. some controversies, and there's been some controversies in our circles. But um, for those that are aware of just. Um, general, you know, I might say Christendom, uh, 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 American evangelicalism, there have been controversies over the past century, quite a few of them also, um, in uh, different circles. So, um, uh, th- that's a, that's a hot topic. It's a topic that there's a lot of confusion about. Um, many people are confused about what they believe about the Trinity. Um, that is, you know, down to the layman all the way up to the pastor, um, the, not to say there aren't people that that know what they believe about the Trinity and have the correct Trinity view, but you might say there's a dearth when it comes to people's understanding uh, of the Trinity today. Right. And um, that, that's one thing that I wanted to, to speak about. So the forum, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to interview Brother Gian here, but uh, we'll have a discussion about it. And, and I'm not pretending to, in this case, be be biased. This is a topic that um, you know I have looked deeply into for quite a while, and I've had to tweak many of my beliefs um, uh, over the years, and I, I was in a state of confusion, as, as many people uh, are today and, and, and have been in the past when it comes to uh, the Trinity in certain areas. So um, I hold to uh, what is known as the classical Trinity, the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity, and uh, there, there is a, uh, a couple of different views today that people will hold to, whether they know it or not. Whether it's you know um, yeah, uh, taught to them uh, or not, but um, <clears throat> today there's going to be either two views of the Trinity that you hold. That's going to be the social Trinity or the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity. And Brother Gian and I both um, uh, strongly adhere to the model of the Trinity, which is the biblical historical model, as we're going to see today. Uh, that's one thing that we want to get to. We want to clear up some confusion that people will have. Um, on the subject of the Trinity. What has the church believed throughout the centuries? That's one thing that I really want to focus on. And and what is the difference between the two 
positions. So let, let's go ahead and start with uh, this, Brother Gian. If you could, could you uh, begin us with uh, begin with just giving us a just a basic definition, a bottom shelf definition of what is the Trinity? Okay, yeah. So the Trinity, in basic terms, I guess we could say it's the uniquely Christian doctrine. And I say that because you cannot be a Christian without affirming it on some level. And it's the uniquely Christian doctrine that God is one. There's one God that eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these three persons are co-equal, co-eternal, co-identical in power, glory, and every divine attribute. That's kind of the bare bones definition that almost every self-identifying Trinitarian can get behind. Um, even if they ultimately redefine a lot of these categories, this is the language you would find in almost every statement of faith, whether that be a Baptist statement of faith, a um, Presbyterian, any statement of faith, even a Pentecostal statement of faith. Um, as a matter of fact, I took a look at the Assemblies of God a statement of faith on the Trinity, and it was rock solid. It had all of these same terms. So this is something you're going to find in every Trinitarian statement of faith. One right, God eternally existing as three persons. Right, right. There's one God. Uh, he he is he is one being of one essence, one nature. You you right. might say so. Those terms will be used synonymous uh, to speak of the oneness of God. And then you would also say that there are three persons. Mm -hmm. so this is the historical language um, that has been used uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, uh, nearly two millennia uh, by the Christian Church. Now, as you started to hint at there, um, people will define some of these terms a little bit differently, right? So they may yeah. have a slightly different understanding of what persons is. And somebody listening to this might think, you know, that uh, persons is not a good word to use to describe the Trinity. Uh, as we said, there's a lot of confusion about the subject of the Trinity today. And that, that's one of the purposes of this, to get back to why do we use the historical language? Uh, what's good reasoning for that? So um, let's, let, let's just uh, uh, move on to the, the next step that would make sense, Brother Gian, would be what is, what is the, the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity? What are the different names that it will go by? And then just, if you could just give me like a, a, a brief description of what it is. Okay, so the classical Orthodox Trinity, I just like to call it the Trinity, <laughs> is right, right. it's known as the uh, the Nicene Doctrine of the Trinity, named after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which kind of hashed a lot of these points out when there was controversy in the early church. But um, a basic definition of what the classical Orthodox Trinity is, it, as far as distinguishing it from every other model of the Trinity is that the unity of the persons, right? will be the same one essence, one God, one being in three persons. And the unity of the persons is grounded in the essence or in the being. And that would entail one mind and one will, right? We see the command in scripture or rather the description in scripture that God is one hero. Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. Uh, that's Deuteronomy six, four. And so the clan, the classic understanding of the Trinity is that the persons are identical in every single divine attribute because they are each identical to the divine nature itself. When I say the divine nature, I'm just referring to God, right? That's a synonym for God, God who he is. And so the way that the great creeds will put them, will put this like the Athanasian Creed, for example, it would say that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, the Holy Spirit is Almighty, and yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. And then it will repeat this sort of thing for various other attributes. So I'll say uh, the Father's eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal, and yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. And they'll say the same thing about right. uh, infinitude, for example. And it will culminate, it culminates by saying the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. And right. what it's getting at here is that the same way that each of the persons are God and yet not their own distinct God, they each have all of the divine attributes and yet not their own unique instance of the divine right. attributes, but rather the son is almighty with the same instance of almightiness that the father and the spirit are. So it's not like it has, it's not like the father and the son have this equivalent, um, but distinct almightiness. It's the same instance of almightiness together with the spirit right. as well. And so what you have to notice is that these Trinitarian creeds, and this is crucial to understanding classical Orthodox Trinitarianism, they, these, they, they, tend, they equate 
the divine nature to the divine attributes. God is right. his attributes. And what the creeds are really alluding to here is the doctrine of divine simplicity. Now, I'm not going to get too much into that, but real quickly, it's simply the assertion, divine simplicity, simplicity is simply the assertion that God is not made up of parts, right? Whether that be concrete physical parts or abstract metaphysical parts, he is not made up of parts. There are not more fundamental parts that come together to form God. And the reason we must affirm this is that if we do not, there are two great problems that can arise. First of all, God would be dependent on these parts to exist if you make him right. to be, uh, be of parts, and therefore he wouldn't be the first cause of all things. One of these parts presumably would be. And the other problem would be is that God would be dependent not only on the parts, but on someone to put those parts together. And so therefore right. he's not God. And so the way we look at God in a classical understanding is that God is not love plus power plus infinitude and you uh, get these together, you shake them together and you come up with God, right? It's not like God uh, needs these parts to come together to make himself uh, to, 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 to be. Uh, God does not possess these divine attributes. He doesn't possess love as something that he has. Rather, he is love. Right? And this is scriptural. Right? We see that the, the scriptures right, right. affirm this. God is love. God does not have love. God is love. God does not have light. God is light. And so understanding divine simplicity is crucial to understanding the classical trinity because it prevents us from saying that there are three different instances of the divine attributes and it guards us from polytheism. Right? Because we can't right. make, we can't distinguish between the persons by saying, well, they each um have uh, different instances of, of divine attributes they each have uh, right. the father was, has his will here was, yeah ahead. brother Gian, that was the exact point that i was getting ready to make was when you when when the persons become individuals with with um differing natures you now have three gods right what right. what me what it means to to be God is to have the divine nature, right? right. That was, ha you know, it's it just the same thing of what it means to be a human, right? Yes. So when, when, when there's a different, when there's a differing or there are differing qualities, as you used attributes, um, this, this becomes a different nature. There is a, mm -hmm. you know, a higher degree of divinity that one person, you might say, mm -hmm. if they still use that term, has, you know, uh, there, there's a higher almighty, okay? There's right. an almighty at the top, and then there's a moderate almighty, and then— right. Uh, it seems to be that the Holy Spirit always gets put in the, at the bottom shelf position by these people. Yeah, right? the lesser Almighty. This this would by by you know all accounts be a form of polytheism, whether they realize it or not. Right. It truly is, or at least the logical uh, conclusion would be polytheism. Exactly. Right. Yeah, the logical conclusion is uh, polytheism, and uh, yeah, the, the so that was that was the first thing that I thought of as you were d describing the so th one of the so one of the key points of um, you know the classical Orthodox view is to emphasize the teaching of monotheism, which mm. is emphasized in Scripture. So as right. we speak here about the historical doctrine of the Trinity and the history of the Trinity, there are many people that may may not be familiar with it, but nonetheless, the historical doctrine of the Trinity is the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. So we emphasize the things that Scripture emphasizes. We allow Scripture to guide us uh, you know, in our thinking when it comes to understanding God's nature. Um, the other point that you made about divine simplicity, every Christian, whether or not they say that that's kind of a high theological term, they all hold to that. Yes. Uh, everyone understands, like you, 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 I'm glad that you reference us. This isn't just us, you know, uh, wanting to adhere to creeds or the historical understanding of Christianity just for the sake of it. We're just kind of, you know, we've, we've, you know, the romance of, of Christian history, as people will say, right. um, nonetheless, no, it is, it is scriptural and yep. God is love. It's not just that God has love, right? right. God is love. Th there are so many different biblical doctrines that connect to this. And that is yes. that God is unchanging, right? His nature doesn't change. Right. And he right. is his nature, uh, yeah. which also, as you uh, pointed out, it, it guards 
uh, the divinity of God from, um, you know, uh, it, it assures that he is that first cause, you might say, right. roughly stated. There's nothing before him. So he didn't derive his love from something else. No. He's not dependent upon something else. God is love. It's, so the old Euthyphro dilemma was a conversation that Plato had had with a man named Euthyphro. And mm-hmm. Christians will revisit this conversation uh, in order to answer a very similar question about the God of the Bible. And uh, basically what Euthyphrode, um posited was uh, two horns, uh, like, like a dichotomy between these own, the two options. And it was, do the gods do good? Because they're obviously polytheists. Do the gods do good because it is good? That is that they're adhering to a standard that's outside of themselves. Or is whatever the gods do good because they do it, right? So that they could, God, you know, the gods could command rape and it's good because the god said so and uh, th- this is posed often oftentimes by atheists to christians um but the 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 bible answered this as euthyphro is you know questioning uh, uh plato uh, you know over in uh the, the in uh greece in athens we would have the God of the Bible had already an- answered this with Moses, um, and we're told in the law that that uh, God is righteousness. It's not just that that um, you know whatever God um, you know will give as a commandment is good because He can just be uh, capricious and and arbitrary and just change whatever it may be. You know uh, to you know rape it, commanding rape, and then it's good. Or that he adheres to a commandment outside of himself. No, God, uh, he is the I am. He is eternal. He's not dependent upon anything. And he is the standard of goodness. He is righteousness. So whatever he commands is coming forth from himself, and it is righteous. So that would be divine simplicity, would it not, Brother Gian? And and, and every Christian understands that. As you pointed out uh, uh, rightly, God is love. Yeah, so as you said, every Christian already believes in divine simplicity whether they're aware of it or not so it's just if you were to ask any christian i probably 99 percent of them would agree that god does not depend upon anything outside of himself to exist almost every christian would agree with that and so if you agree with that then you believe in divine simplicity the rest is just hashing out the details right because you have to guard this fundamental christian idea that god is the first cause of all things and therefore he cannot be made up of parts he must be a simple being and so given that it is impossible to distinguish between the persons of the trinity by any attributes whether that be will or power or intellect or any of those things because that would constitute three instances of that divine attribute and now you've made god to be composed of parts that are more fundamental than himself right you need this one uh, intellect and this intellect and this intellect and together that makes up one god see you can't do that um if you're understanding the doctrine of divine simplicity so in classical orthodox trinitarianism the persons are distinguished solely by their eternal relation of origin and that would be right, simply right and that'll be very important right that, this is crucial uh, to, to in order to understand what the actual distinction between the persons are from eternity past and that is that the fathers of none the son is eternally begotten of the father or the word eternally proceeds from the father and the holy spirit eternally proceeds from both the father and the son that's how you distinguish between the persons that's known as the eternal relations of origin and so the persons are substantially one they are the same being with the same mind and will Uh, the bible for example speaks of the mind of the lord or the will of the lord you never see any instance of the minds or the the wills you see the the counsel of his own will for example uh so while god is one in essence and being we we must maintain that there are three persons in this one being and now that term persons was a term that was used to denote real distinctions in God, but not three autonomous beings right. with their own mind and their, and their own will. The way that some, uh, the way that we use persons colloquially today to refer to one another. I'm a person and you're a person, Pastor Baker, but this is not what we mean when we're talking about uh, the Trinity, the persons of the Trinity. As a matter of fact, historically, uh, another term that is more technical that has been used in church history is that of subsistences. So one God in right. three subsistences. Um, and so that, that is a more technical term, not to say that we discard persons, but that has been the more precise term to use. Um, 
And right. so in this one being, there are three real, eternal, ontological distinctions, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, and the way you distinguish between them are their relation to one another. The fathers of none, the Son eternally begotten, the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds. Now, the only caveat to this would be that in classical Trinitarianism, we would also make the distinction between God in eternity, God ad intra, right. in and of himself, and God in creation history, or in the economy, as it's said, or ad extra. How, yeah, how he, how he reveals himself to us, how we would see him throughout human exactly, history. Exactly, how he reveals himself to us, ad extra, outside of himself. And uh, so when we refer to ad intra, in and of himself, from all eternity, the only distinction between the persons would be those eternal relations of origin that we already went by, which, by the way, are very biblical, if you haven't noticed. The right. Father, I mean— That was the other point that I was going to make. Yeah, I mean, uh, all throughout Scripture, we see, we see this specifically a few different times where it tells us that all things are of God, mm -hmm. that is the Father, mm -hmm. and all things are by the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah, so he, he, he plays that. And even—, even um, um, when we see God revealing himself to us um, outside of himself in that sense, right, to us, um, even still, that reflects ad intra. Yeah. It will reflect it because God God is not going to behave any other way than his nature, right? right. He, he, the divine nature, he doesn't change. Um, he, he is the word of God within the Trinity, right? Mm. He is the son of God. Uh, we also see him filling the the role of the mediator, right? So mm -hmm. all things are of God the Father, right? That's that's uh, what we are we are uh, uh, attempting mm -hmm. to get to, but we go by Jesus Christ. So this is biblical, was the point I was making. Right, right. right. The, it, all things are of the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit, right? So exactly, right, right. So. Um, so yeah, the, the the eternal relations of origin. We're not just that's not some arbitrary category we created. That's we yeah. see that the Son is begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. He's called the Spirit of the Father as well as the Spirit of the Son, so on and so forth. So that would be how you distinguish ad intra from eternity past. But there are further economic distinctions or distinctions uh, that are between the persons um, beyond this when we when they when he acts in creation history. So, uh, for example, it is the Son that was incarnate in history, uh, not the Father. And it is the Holy Spirit that right. is said to indwell us, not the Son or the Father. But, but the, the, the key here is to remember that even in these economic distinctions, we recognize that God acts always as a Trinity because He is Trinity. He is Trinity, so he always acts right. as a Trinity. And this is known as the doctrine of inseparable operations. So an example of this would be that even though the Holy Spirit is said to be the one that indwells us, he appropriates that work. He's at the forefront of that work. The Father and the Son are also said to indwell the believer. So, so you see, for example, in John 14, 23, it says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, that's the Father and the Son, and make our abode with him. So the Father and the Son also make their abode with us. Right. The point being that even though it's the Holy Spirit that is said to be at the forefront that appropriates this work of indwelling the believer, the Father and the Son also do it. And the point here is that you right. can't— Right, and this is again connected to divine simplicity once more. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Right. You don't have— Right. You cannot get one person alone. He's not a part of right. God. Where you encounter right. one person, right. you get you, you encounter the three. Right. Right. And so this and, and this would be how God works throughout creation. This is how God works in salvation, right? This is absolutely. In, in the act of redemption. So um you yeah, you you can't because it is truly and you can see how the, the a couple of the, the the sub doctrines, the subtopics overlap here. Right. It also speaks to the unity, the the, the monotheism or the oneness of God. There truly is one God. Right. It's not as if there, you know, the the these these three divine beings that can work entirely uh, independent or autonomously from one another. Right. Right. So the, God always acts as Trinity because God is Trinity, and so you cannot get one person alone. You get whatever you get one person, you get the three. And so this itself right. is is another tangential doctrine <laughs> to classical Trinitarianism, which is known as perichoresis. The fact that each person inseparably indwells the other i am in the father the father in me you cannot get one person without the three because they are inseparably united in one being and so in a nutshell i know we kind of went through a lot of things there but it's it's important to understand these things when we're talking about the trinity but in a nutshell 
Classical Orthodox Trinitarianism asserts that God is one being with one mind and one will, and three in person, and person defined by the eternal relations of origin and nothing else. Right. That is. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. There's a couple of good, uh, uh, really good points in there that can help somebody understand uh, the historical and biblical view of the Trinity. And you know, it, it, you could all uh, even summarize it, um, or or help yourself to make sense. You might say um, of all of those doctrines, because I know you pointed out there's a lot of stuff to throw at everybody. Yeah. But God is spirit. God is spirit. He's not made up of parts. Mm -hmm. He is truly one God, and he is he is spirit. He is a spirit. So um, you could you know those though all of those teachings and doctrines are found all throughout the Bible, but they are the logical conclusion even of the fact that God is a spirit. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, so that's basically the 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 classical uh, 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 Orthodox Trinity. Sometimes it's referred to. Just as the Orthodox Trinity, sometimes it's referred to as the classical Trinity. Brother or Ni or Nicene Orthodoxy. Trinity. Yeah, or Nicene Orthodoxy, right. Right. Yeah. And um But as you stated, so, I like uh, to just call it the Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, the Trinity, right. Yeah. So um the one of the reasons why it's referred to as the the Orthodox Trinity, may, people may not be familiar with that term if they you know, they, they don't know um uh just the the nomenclature mm. um of what would be the subject of theology, really, uh, or even just studying church history? But the word, the term orthodox just means sound doctrine or right. sound teaching. Yeah. Right. So I, I would hope that everyone would pursue uh, an orthodox trinity, right? Right. A, a sound doctrinal view of the trinity. Right. I, um, I think people it, 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 might, it, might shy away from the term orthodox. I think cause some people might think you're t we're talking about Eastern Orthodox or something like Eastern that. Eastern Orthodox. Right. No, we're talking about orthodox. We're talking about sound doctrine. We're talking about what Christians as a whole, have affirmed regarding the doctrine of the Trinity right. throughout the ages. That's what we mean by orthodox. Right, right. And yeah. we'll get into how people will, they, they tend to cut themselves off, especially modern day in, a, in, a, in, a, in America, where we have this strong individualism right. sort of attitude, where yeah. it's just me and my Bible, and right. I don't need anything else, mm -hmm. right? Um, we'll get into the importance of, of knowing church history and things like that, because we have a benefit from church history, and we're meant to. Um, but uh, yeah, um, Brother Gian, that was a real good description of the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity. Let's, um, if you don't mind, give me, if you could, um, kind of a, a breakdown of what is the other view of the Trinity that people will hold today. Many people aren't even aware that this is you know, what they would hold. Some people would hold a hybrid of the two, mm -hmm. as you and I have, have pointed out and we've talked before. But uh, uh, what is the social Trinity? We have the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity, and then there are also some people that would hold to, uh, unbeknownst, as I said, the social Trinity. Give, give us a description of what that is. Okay, so the social trinity, I would say, as you alluded to there, that most people hold to a hybrid of social trinitarianism, a classical trinitarianism. But the social, full-fledged social trinitarianism is um, is really an ivory tower doctrine, and what it really entails is is the following: it's really a modern conception of the trinity that has was not seen prior to the 18th century. It really wasn't. If you read all of the the church fathers, and obviously I'm using that term just as a colloquialism as how they are referred to. A lot of people might be uncomfortable with the term church fathers. But if you read all of the church fathers and you read uh, all the reformers in the 16th century, there is unanimity of thought on the basic tenets of classical Orthodox Trinitarianism. It's not really until the 17th and 18th century with the advent of the so-called Enlightenment um, and all of these German Enlightenment philosophers like Hegel and Kant, those are kind of the two most uh, well-known, they start popping up. And all of a sudden, you have a new conception of the Trinity, which comes just in time uh, with their advent, uh, which it's not really a coincidence. It begins to uh, affect their philosophy, begins to affect liberal German theologians. Now, before getting into all of that, because I think that's important to understand, just a, a, a brief description of the actual doctrine of social Trinitarianism, it has two fundamental errors, I would say. It, it, first of all, it redefines the historical use of the word person um, as used by the Christian church throughout uh, history, and it also redefines God's unity. So persons are redefined as autonomous beings with their own mind and their own will, 
And the unity of God is redefined as being one of mutual love and agreement or a community of persons, as you will. And so they make God almost like God Inc. Like God is a corporation of persons together. Right. 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 <laughs> um, and so it, it, in classical, oh, sorry, in social Trinitarianism, God is not substantially and numerically one the way he would be in the classical Trinitarian model, but he's only really categorically one. There are three beings that happen to fall into this category uh, known as God. That's the way they would view God. And, and of course, this, is not, this does not happen overnight or coincidentally. Um, getting back to these German Enlightenment philosophers, Hegel and Kant, they began to teach their, you know, their vain metaphysical doctrine that there is no such thing as essence. Right? And what they're really getting at there is that you can't really know what something truly is is a thing is not something in and of itself but rather it is only a thing insofar as it is experienced by someone else uh and so that that's kind of like one of their main doctrines there and in addition to this these philosophers also began to teach religion as a means to the end of humanism and so the chief end well, of all see, things you can see subjectivism obviously in that there right and then, you know a, a pragmatism coming into it as well exactly it's just how you experience it and it's just hey it's we're, we all it's all uh uh on a on a practical level right everything exactly that's a good way of putting it of simplifying it it's all uh, it all must be viewed through the lens of pragmatism and so in addition to viewing um to, to having this view of essence where like there's no really no such thing as something in and of itself it only exists as it relates to someone else as someone else experiences it they started to teach, you know, humanism. And so they started to teach their religion had value insofar as its ability to inspire more uh, moral behavior among the adherents. Um, and so the chief end of all things was the good of man, not the good of God, not, not the glory of God, but the good of man. And so insofar as it was good right. for man, religion was good. And, and so to sum up the teachings of the Enlightenment philosophers, there's no such thing as essence. Things only exist as they are directly experienced, and religion, and particularly Christianity is what they're working with at the time, is only valuable as a means to further the good of man. And so, how does this affect the Trinity? Okay, you might be asking, well, what does it have to do with the Trinity? Well, two ways primarily. First of all, um, these liberal German theologians, they, they began to be influenced by their countrymen, Hegel and Kant, and they began to likewise see the essence of the Christian faith to be one of love of neighbor or uh, for the good of man. You know, this humanistic view of uh, Christianity as opposed to all things being for the glory of God, right? That's really what the essence of the Christian faith is. They started to view it as, well, everything is for the good of man. And in light of this, the Trinity became an unnecessary appendage uh, to these liberal theologians. The way they thought is that, even if it was true, even if the Trinity is true, it still wouldn't actually help to achieve the ultimate goal of loving our neighbor and, and to further the happiness of man. Because remember, they're seeing Christianity as the mere means to the end right. of humanism. And, and the Trinity doesn't really get you there. It doesn't help you <laughs> really to achieve right, humanism, right. right? And so basically they just got rid of the Trinity and it really did seem to disappear um, in, in, during this period of the Enlightenment. So you get like a dearth of writing on Trinitarian doctrine in the decades subsequent to this. So we're talking about uh, the early 1800s um, and the late 1700s, early 1800s. And this is coming after a wealth of writings on the Trinity by all the reformers. Um, but then after a couple decades, these um, liberal theologians begin to get some pushback. And, and the pushback was kind of the following. Um, the Trinity is relevant because it is our social program. It is our model for the community. It is a blueprint for our society. Uh, we are to love one another and work toward a common goal, even if each of us have our own individual minds and wills and positions in society, we work together in mutual love. And that was kind of the pushback. No, we need the Trinity because it's our social program. But the, if you notice that the problem with this pushback was that it was done with the same modern enlightenment framework. It's just really a slightly less liberal approach to the Trinity, which still fundamentally right. accepts Kant and Hegel's metaphysical categories, right? That, that a thing cannot be truly known other than how you directly experience it. And, and you can see this clearly in social Trinitarian, in the social Trinitarian conception of the persons of the Trinity. They define the persons by extrapolating and, and I would say exaggerating some of the economic aspects of the Trinity, 
right? Uh, referring to the, the Trinity ad extra in history. And so uh, the persons are defined by what they do and and how they relate to us in creation history and not by who they are in eternity past ad intra as being right. one being, right. the fathers and, of none, the sons. Go, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, these are... <clears throat> These are because you know people may may get bogged down with the history. Obviously, they need to know the history of where this came from, and they you know they'd be ignorant of the repercussions of the past and how thing you, we get to where we are today and, right. and things like that. If that was the case, but but nonetheless, these these are biblical errors that they are making. That's one of the points, right? <clears throat> the, these are hum, hermeneutical errors that Correct. they're making. They are interpreting Christ uh, on Earth, oftentimes in in his with his human nature, and they're taking attributes that are are linked with his human nature and results of his human nature and then extrapolating that or applying right. that to his divinity right these, so these are these are biblical errors of interpretation yes absolutely yeah and a lot of people i think the reason i go through the history is because some people might be under the impression some people who are um very uh, that are otherwise very conservative not realize not they might not be realizing that they're holding to actually a liberal framework when it comes to their doctrine of the trinity which right, is why i'm right. why i'm bothering to go through all this but as you stated um in social trinitarianism the persons are defined by what they do in in history and not who they are in eternity past right so instead of it being one being one essence one substance uh you know but three persons within this one being right the fathers of none the son eternally begotten the spirit eternally spirated that's not how they define the persons because this cannot be known that's not how we experience the trinity i don't experience the son being eternally begotten i don't experience the spirit eternally proceeding from father and son and so the eternal relations of origin are just mere speculations that doesn't matter to me and so in social trinitarianism instead the father is only viewed as the one who sends the son into the earth and then the Son is viewed solely, as you stated, in terms of the Incarnation, and then the Spirit for His indwelling of the believer. But the problem with defining the Trinity solely in terms of the economy, solely in terms of how He works in uh, in creation history, is, is that the Bible often emphasizes the appropriation, as we already uh, stated, the appropriation of one of the persons in a particular work, even if all three are involved in the work. And so right. w without a proper qualification of these acts being acts of the one being of God, of, of the Trinity itself, this all acts are the acts of the, of the Trinity. If you don't properly qualify the ad extra um, acts of each of the persons by, by viewing it within the lens of the one being who is God, you begin to view these acts in history as being done by three different autonomous beings who happen to love each other and agree with one another. And, and this right, really... Right goes hand in hand with the abandonment of viewing God as a transcendent being. And th this would be right. uh, known as theistic personalism versus the classical mm -hmm. understanding of God, the classical doctrine of God. And, and this, again, goes back to Hegel and Kant. If only what I can experience is real, then God must be just like me and not this transcendent being that is beyond my comprehension. And so what is the, the consequence of this is that the anthropomorphic or analogical language that is used in scripture begins to be read literally. So God literally changes his mind now. He literally right. repents and changes his mind. He's no longer immutable, right? You no longer hold right. to the immutability of God. The fact that he does not change. I'm the Lord, I change not. And so, yeah. So, brother Gian, it would basically be that now they make God into a human being, but he's not even just like an individual human being. He's three, he's, he's three exactly. human beings in this case because of the misunderstanding of persons as exactly. well. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and you even yeah, see and, there's an inversion of sound hermeneutics. And so, when the Bible says, right. for example, as I, I am the Lord, I change not. This is viewed as, anal as an analogical statement by social Trinitarians instead of a literal pronouncement of God's very nature. Right? right. We would have viewed that correctly right. as God saying, I'm the Lord. I, I literally do not change. I right, do right. not change yeah. because he, that would entail. He's always been just. He's always exactly. been righteous. He's always been love. He's always been spirit. He's always been Trinity. And that's a, a key statement you made earlier that I didn't emphasize that I want the, the, the listeners really need to hang on to and put in their back pocket is this. God is Trinity. God is, God Trinity. is Trinity. There are so many. There are so many things wrapped up in that 
that that that framing of of that statement. And first of all, that God, you know, it is his very nature that is that he is Trinity. Mm-hmm. This isn't modes that he's shifting into. This is another reason, and we'll flesh this out a little bit more right. shortly. But this is another reason why the why the term persons is the proper term. Right. That the, the persons uh, is a reality within God, right? Mm-hmm. It, or or it speaks of and denotes a reality within God. And that's why you know God is Trinity is an important statement. But um, uh, furthermore, it speaks of the unity we can see in in uh, the one true God. God mm. is Trinity. Right. God is Trinity. You you can see the singularity uh, obviously in that as well with the verb that's used. Okay, uh, brother Gian, uh, you can continue on. What were you saying? Oh, right. Just to finish off on on social trinitarianism here. Um, so. I was talking about how they they invert sound hermeneutics, so they'll view "I'm the Lord, I change not." That is instead of being a literal right. pronouncement of God's nature, that begins. To, that's really an analogical statement, right? It's not literal, right. but the Lord repented. Now that is actually a literal statement about God's nature in social trinitarianism, right? right? Instead of instead of it being anthropomorphic language or anthropomorphic right. statement about God. What is anthropomorphic? Just in case the listener is not familiar with that term, what would be anthropomorphic? That's that's just a, a fancy word to what say. Does the term mean? God speaking of Himself in human terms, so we can understand. Because otherwise, we would not. So, so it reveals a truth about God, but we ought not to make it a one-to-one correlation uh, uh, right. b- between us and uh, between us and God. Right. So, so in this context, anthropomorphic, it's like a literary device, right? It's a literary it's a way in which device. God will speak about Himself uh, in human form. Anthro meaning man or human, and then you know morph being being formed so he's he is analogically and through analogies you know uh speaking of himself as though he were a human obviously he's not but it's in order to communicate truths to us now um real quick if you don't mind brother gian just kind of as a, in a, in parenthesis and in, in a parenthesis can you uh as we take a pause on this note can you explain why that's dangerous and then we're going to revisit that as well towards the end but can you give us a passage in the bible um where if you attempted to uh, uh, interpret it literally. I think we discussed this, right? Mm. Uh, you and I uh, discussed it recently, where it would be dangerous if you were to attempt to try to take things throughout Scripture uh, literally when it's meant to be anthropomorphic. Well, off the top of my head, I can think of, for example, uh, God uh, not knowing, uh, for example, the um, uh, whether or not... Sorry, there's a fly that <laughs> was in here that was attacking me. Yeah. <laughs> But one off the top of my head would be when God is going to is trying Abraham, and and it says right. that's at, what I was referring to. Right, it says at the end of, of the trial when when Abraham is is ready to um, offer up Isaac and he ultimately does not because the angel of the Lord stops him. It says, "Now I know that thou fearest God because thou hast not uh, withheld right. thy son, that only begotten son, from me." Now did God not know that? Are we to believe that right. God didn't actually know that, or is He just speaking in anthropomorphic terms? Obviously, right, and in context, yeah, in context, it's obvious that he's saying that for Abraham's purposes. Of course, right. So, in his so context, yeah, that would be just one example of the dangers of not uh, uh, properly understanding that God is quite frequently uh, using anthropomorphic language to speak of Himself. And so, in context of the Trinity, it, when we get back to social trinitarianism. Instead of viewing the love between the persons as occurring within the one being, within the one mind who is God, now the Father and the Son love each other in the same way that I love my wife, for example, which right. necessitates two separate minds and intellects. And wills, and, yeah. And you begin to see that this is the way, you know, this is indistinguishable from polytheism, really, if you're starting it, to view God really. this way. So, for example, there's a Mormon theologian and philosopher named Blake Osler who has written in favor of social Trinitarianism, saying that it is actually compatible with Mormonism. He's viewing it as this type of a a bridge between the gap of uh, classical or Orthodox Christianity and uh, Mormonism. Um, As a matter of fact, he said in a Mormon conference, uh, and I quote, social Trinitarianism is very, very close to what would be considered a Mormon view. That's what he said, right? Yeah. So, so that, that this is the problem of social trinitarianism. You get these three distinct beings, these three um, autonomous beings. They love each other the same way I love my wife, and my wife loves me back. We're two different intellects and wills. Uh, but, but one thing I will say to to finish this, you know, social trinitarianism uh, off is that thankfully 
true full-fledged social Trinitarianism is not very common. Um, the, the idea that, you know, there's three separate beings with their own autonomous minds and wills. It's really an ivory tower doctrine for the most part. It's only really held by liberal theologians and secular institutions like Harvard or Yale, and they just happen to be part of the theology department or something like that. Um, so it doesn't really exist outside of that. Uh, you might find it actually in, in some fringe groups within the independent fundamental Baptist movement, though. <laughs> but that's about it. True or full flex. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and while, while being totally completely unaware that what they believe is social trinitarianism and, right and maybe even assuming that they they have believed and taught the orthodox trinity right during yeah. that time yeah yeah so the, the the point of that though truly that we can learn from is that that's <clears throat> you know the, these groups would be a sampling of truly what so many where so many Christians are, completely unaware of what they even, you know, many Christians don't even think deeply about the Trinity, um, unfortunately. That's true. And if they would, they would, of course, use the terms uh, one God, three persons. And as you said, if you were to ask them um, to articulate or kind of give you something, you know, a little bit more to sink your teeth into, they would they would probably give you a little bit of a hybrid. And right. they would use bad language. Yeah. And, um, I mean, all of us would be able to say, hey, I've made those same mistakes in the past, right? Certainly. That's, that's the reason for this discussion Certainly. is to yeah. bring clarity to the topic of the Trinity. You know, I myself have had uh, 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 different things that I was uh, that were beliefs that I held that were erroneous when it came to the Trinity, and a lot of it, uh, w you know, especially my rejection of the terms, not wanting to use persons, um, and uh, and other things, came from my misunderstanding of what the the orthodox view of the trinity is what the historical view of the trinity is and to say that you're totally outside of that is impossible because even at the time i i mean i can look back when i used uh, uh faulty language erroneous language when it comes to the trinity i was still allowing the views of Today, you might say, modernly, um, and the definitions of the terms to frame my position. Yeah, so it's say, inevitable. Hey, well, I, I, it's inevitable. So yeah. you, I, you, you, you cannot help to get outside of your own context, right? You, you, mm -hmm. Historically, your environment, where you live. So my understanding at that time was, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, I, uh, I believe that there is one God. OK, um, you know, one mind, one will. Mm -hmm. I understood these. The, this is abundantly clear in Scripture. I mean, the Bible is categorically clear that there is the mind of the Lord. As you mentioned, we would all cringe if we heard someone preach uh, the minds of the Lord. Right. Uh, just immediately. That's going to. But, but know, there are preachers that, out there. <laughs> There are pictures <laughs> out there, yeah. I don't know if they would flippantly say it while you know in conversation, but if they break it down for you, nonetheless, there, right, there right. are multiple minds of the Lord. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there are preachers out there. I wonder who they are. Yeah. But uh, so, so you have um, you you have the framework that we live within. You can't get outside of it. Mm -hmm. you know, even the rejection of the term persons is still you living within your own environment and saying, hey, I don't, I don't receive that word because mm -hmm. based on what you think it means in the terms of the context of, of our everyday colloquial way in which we use the word person, a human person, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, my understanding was, hey, um, Orthodox Trinitarianism was, was basically what you described as the social trinity. Mm -hmm. You know, so I believe I believe there's one God with one mind and one will. So if I have the option of what is social trinitarianism, I thought was the orthodox trinity, right? Or you know, you know, uh, oneness Pentecostalism, I reject both of those. I just hold to the biblical trinity, right? Where there's right. one God with one mind with one will, but where there there are true distinctions within God's nature that mm -hmm. are realities. Right. And my understanding of persons, because of the confusion that comes from the social trinity, was that as I I said, social trinitarian. Uh, definitions and that would be that they each have their own mind and will you, you took so, social um, trinitarianism for granted as being the actual historical definition of the term person right and therefore you rejected what you thought was the historical orthodox the trinity historical, right exactly and right. and it even caused me to get into error right. of referring to to uh, uh jesus as the father mm -hmm. and the reason is because if if you know persons right is 
each having a mind, will. And then my other option way over here is the oneness Pentecostalism. As I said, I reject both of those. I hold to the biblical trinity, and if there's one mind and, and, and one will, right, mm-hmm. of that one God, well, then that must mean that Jesus is the Father, right? right? Which is also an error. Right, it, right? It, which and, is and, an error. Yeah, it is an error. And, um, but uh, th- that was my extrapolation, because you can't get outside of the paradigm, right? Right. You, you're, you're influenced either way to some degree by the definitions and by the positions of your day. Right. So, so therefore, it is, it is vital to get back to the original definitions of those terms, right? That's why history is important. You, you can't just all of a sudden come up with your own definition of persons as it pertains to the Trinity. What did these people mean? And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But what did these people mean when they said three persons? Right? So, right. so you can't just all of a sudden now, um, you know, just uh, assume your definition as being the one that has been affirmed um, or what right, it, yeah. uh, of the Trinity. Right. Yeah, you define it today, and then you reject it based on your terms. Right, exactly. Right? Not not based on how that term or that word was used throughout the centuries. Correct. Right. Yeah, so um, you gave us a little bit of the history of the social trinity. We saw where it came from. You kind of described to us, or you did describe to us, what the social trinity is. Uh, can you can you hit on the just the history of what is the biblical trinity, uh, what is considered the classical orthodox view of the trinity? Can you give us a, a rundown of that? Just kind of the basic landmarks and and just just some highlights throughout history and how we got uh, to where we are today. We saw the social trinity. Its history went back to the 19th century, late 18th century, right? Right. So let let's talk about the real true trinity that christians have held to for two millennia for two thousand years okay give All us right. that if you could okay so so the trinity it, it really is a unique doctrine in the sense that it is basically the subject of the first fights in church history okay so it, right after the death of the apostles christians or everybody even non-christians are they're asking basically these three questions um who is god who is jesus and how do the two relate and so the church, the early church, is occupied with a- answering these questions in the wake of many heresies arising. And so the, the overwhelming majority of early church writings and discourse, it centers around these questions, right? Which entails not only theology proper and, and the Trinity, but Christology as well. But, but that would, we'll put that aside for another day. But first, I want to start off by saying that we ought to take seriously the conclusions reached by the early church on the doctrine of the Trinity— First of all, because it's scriptural, okay? It is scriptural, and I think that's conclusive. But secondly, these men thought these things through very thoroughly, okay? This wasn't like something that that they just, you know, uh, came off, that was off the cuff. These were um, the result of of, centuries of arguments with heretics and hearing their arguments and coming up with an answer from scripture, so on and so forth. And so this cannot be said of other doctrines such as justification, right? That's not really what the early church is occupied with. And so um, consequently, you can hear them say weird things about justification because usually it's just talking about that off the cuff. But this is not true of the Trinity. When it comes to the doctrine of God, this is something that they were spot on about because they were constantly talking about it and fighting about it. And so getting into the history of the Trinity, the, the first Trinitarian heresy that arises is Sabellianism which is also known as modalism, but very similar to what the oneness Pentecostals believe today. And so what this would teach is that God is not ontologically, meaning not in his very nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are really just three modes or manifestations or different roles or different masks that God takes on. And so in this position, the Son or the Word is not an eternally pre-existent distinct person in the trinity but he only really comes to be in bethlehem's manger and so this is why um uh it's been phrased as by them themselves the father took on the role of the son and this is why early christians called this the heresy of patripassionism uh, meaning the father suffering so because uh, modalism would in some forms of it anyhow would say that it was the father that suffered and died on the cross so on and so forth 
And so, as far as modalism and Sabellianism went, the distinction between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're not real distinctions in God. God does not eternally exist this way, but they're only distinctions in our minds as roles that God reveals himself to mankind. And so, the problem with this doctrine is that while it, it upholds monotheism, it rejects the true eternal distinctions in the Godhead. And this is utterly rejected as heresy and as a denial of the eternality of the second person of the Trinity, uh, primarily through, uh, by Tertullian and his work. And he, he's a, a North African theologian in the second century. Um, he's really the first prolific writer that begins to flesh out the doctrine of the Trinity in response to these Sabellian modalist heretics. And uh, to be honest, his conception of the Trinity is a bit primitive. It's a bit incomplete. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll have to forgive him for that, obviously, because he didn't have the benefit of experiencing the discourse that came after him and 2,000 years of church um, material and all that. But for the most part, it's, it's very sound. He's actually the first one that used the word Trinity. He's the first one to actually use that term, the first one to say three persons, one substance, Trinity. All these words were really coined by um, Tertullian. And to get get into his illustration of what the trinity was it's a bit crass but you get to see the framework he's working that, that he's used that he's using and so he would view the trinity as the the son and the spirit as the two arms of the father now now he doesn't mean to use that as some sort of a, as god literally has a body he writes elsewhere that god does not have a body but that is right, that is that's his an analogy that is his analogy right that it's the, the father is the, the you know the, the torso you could say the son and the spirit are the two arms of the father but what you're seeing there is that he has one being in mind right not these three mm -hmm. autonomous different beings he's viewing god fundamentally as one being and so you get to see right and away. And also real distinctions, right? And, these 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 are not modes. That's what he's fighting against. These right. are realities that are that are that are that are steady and stable that exist within reality. Right. The next great Trinitarian heresy uh, was a much more formidable opponent, is which is Arianism, and this is basically just a denial of the deity of Christ. It's very similar to the view of the Jehovah Witnesses today. Uh, the slogan of the arians was there was a time when the sun was not right and, and this is really where extra biblical terms become important because arius was an expert at finding a way to agree with any verse that you might throw at him and so often he's being uh confronted with uh john 1 1 in the beginning was a word and the word was with god and the word was god and arius was able to say yes the word was god he's a god Right, much like we find that perversion in the modern uh, in the Bible of the Jehovah Witnesses today, but he was an expert at trying at somehow finding a way to agree with every scripture they threw at him, and this culminates with the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And the Council uses the term homoousios to speak of the Father and the Son. Right, they said that the Son is homoousios with the Father, and that's just a Greek word for one mind, one or rather one essence the same essence, the right, same being, right. which entails the same mind as the Father. And right. to this, Arius could not agree. He couldn't agree with the term. Right. And that really, what it did was expose that he didn't believe the Bible, right? Even though he could find a way to, to, to agree somehow by twisting scripture, he couldn't agree to this term, which is a, it's what the Bible teaches. Even though the term is not directly found in the Bible, it is undeniably what scripture teaches, that God is one being. Absolutely. God is one being. Uh, and the Father, Son, Holy Spirit share fully in this being. The Son truly is of the same right. essence, of the same being as the Father. And so uh, the council formulates the Nicene Creed. And there's a bunch of uh, myths going about, around about what the Nicene Creed was about, a lot, or the, the Council right. of Nicaea. A lot of people think it's about the canon of Scripture. Isn't that where they like chose the canon? Yeah, that, yeah, I yeah. Think Joe Rogan put that out <laughs> That's there. That's what everybody, everybody thinks. That's, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Constantine picked the, the what books were going to be in the Bible. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. That so, Nicene Creed is what I heard. Exactly. Oh, yeah, good. and uh, it's Christmas time, man. So share with us what took place with uh, uh, Saint Nick. Right, oh, sure right. Yeah, yeah, St. Nick. Good yeah, old St. Yeah. Nick. So St. Yeah. Nick, in th yeah. during the council, this is a great anecdote from, from the council. Uh, during the, during the, 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 the arguments, St. Nick, and I'm forgetting his, his whole name, uh, where he was from, but he was so enraged with Arius when he was um, going off about 
the son not being true deity the way the father is, he got so angry, he got up in the middle of this discussion and he punched uh, Arius right in the face. So, uh, right. Yeah, so that was a, a great <laughs> moment in, in uh, church history, you could say. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, was, uh, he was shortly thereafter deposed from his position as elder and then was reinstalled a little bit later. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad he yeah. was reinstalled. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, his heart was so in the right cool. place. But, uh, <laughs> his heart was in the right place. That was what I was getting at, actually. Yeah. yeah you, so you picked that up. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know that he was a legitimate character throughout history. And obviously, as time went on, there's been myth and things that have been added to it. But nonetheless, you know, he was, he was, a, he was a wealthy guy that had inherited quite a bit of wealth from his parents. And he, he went around and he used that wealth um, to uh, secretly, not to offend anyone's pride, but to secretly, uh, you know, slip gold under their door or in and i heard some i don't even it's probably even a part of the embellishment or the myth but that he did actually drop down chimneys and oh. th- that is the gold not himself right yeah. but that he that he would drop it down down the chimney or that he would just find a way to get it into the house because he didn't want to offend people right because mm. everyone was a hard worker then they just didn't have money right uh so he yeah so that's one of the so he was a real bishop Yes, he was a real bishop right. uh, who punched Arius. So that's one of the. the uh, yeah. But yeah, that that's that just gets into how it's a highlight. Yeah, that's a highlight <laughs> of of the the actual Council of Nicaea. But yeah, there's many different. Hey, we didn't know that. Uh, yeah, brother G, I got to throw this out there. We didn't know that we were going to have to to spiritually punch some Ariuses today, right? Uh, and but they but they would be Jehovah's Witnesses. No, they wouldn't They'd be Jehovah's be, Witnesses. As you mentioned, it's a sect of Independent Baptist. Yeah, I think to be fair, yeah. it's probably more like semi Aryans, but it's it's getting yeah, there. Right, right, right. 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 We'll get yeah. to that maybe in a second um, with the whole eternal functional subordination controversy. But yeah, there's a, that, all that to say. There's a lot of myths about what happened in Nicaea. People talk about, like you said, uh, the canon of scripture was determined there, or other people just make up these these crazy myths about Constantine just creating Roman Catholicism right there and then, where he just replaces all the uh, the Greek gods with the saints, the name of the saints, or something like that, and and whatever. But there's a bunch of other things. But all that to say, what really went on there was a discussion on theology proper and the trinity and so the council formulates the nicene creed which ashes out the doctrine of the trinity and it asserts the deity of the father the son and the holy spirit all three of their the deity of each is affirmed and they are distinguished by the eternal relations of origin right the father of none the son eternally begotten of the father the holy spirit eternally proceeding and so um, about 100 years later the athanasian creed further details this and and adds to this the anathemas <laughs> so like if you don't agree with the doctrine of the trinity you, you're not saved you're going to hell um and it is really through these great creeds that the historical trinitarian language of three persons in one being uh comes to be and uh but as i stated persons was never intended to denote three autonomous beings with their own wills and their own intellects this was how essence and being was defined uh, by all of these early writers, not person. That's not they, they didn't view will as being attached to being or essence. They viewed it, or rather, they viewed it as being attached to being and to essence and not right. to person. Um, person was intended to right. denote a true eternal distinction within the one being who is God, but not but nothing else. Not not this autonomous being, as is sometimes positive. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Persons is is to uh, denote a true identity within the being of God that is a reality that is an eternal reality and that is is uh, uh, one and in the very nature of God that's again that that's why that statement is so powerful God is Trinity God is Trinity God works as Trinity mm-hmm. it, uh, it you uh, uh, spoke about the the uh, inseparable uh, uh, operations of God uh, earlier mm-hmm. the case of that is is um, predicated upon the fact that God is Trinity. Thus, when God works, he's not going to work any way other than Trinity because his very nature is Trinity. Correct. Correct. Right. So the the persons are within that reality, and that's why we use the term persons. Um, this is not to be confused with the misunderstanding of persons within within the, uh, the, the model of the social Trinity, right? But r- it, real quick, it's probably good to maybe hammer this out a little bit more of of why 
persons is so important. So we kind of hit on because it denotes the reality, mm-hmm. right? Um, but why not another term, you know, uh, Brother Gian? So you mentioned subsistences. A lot of uh, reformers uh, posited that term, and mm-hmm. and you, I think you uh, some Baptists even use that for a period of time. But uh, why is that so important? Why not just drop that term and create another one? Okay, what so- would you say? So subsistences will be perfect. The problem is I don't think it's really going to catch amongst the laity. I don't think people are really going to you know, start right. using the term subsistences. Um, I would say we received the term persons because it is a word that was, that was made and framed amongst Christians. Right? It is our right. word. We inherited this, this term from prior generations of Christians. And, and really... You could say, well, I don't like the term persons. Well, what other term do you posit? What other term are you suggesting? Right. Because every term is going to come short of describing what, you know, the real distinct, exactly. the real distinction in God. So as Augustine, Augustine put it this way. He was like, we say persons, not because we mean three different persons, but so as to not keep silent. Right? In other words, we say persons because we can't say anything else otherwise. This is about as good as we're going to get it. And so it's the best word, basically. Yeah, it's the, yeah, exactly. It's the best word, especially if it's being qualified by three persons in one God, in one essence, in one being. Right. And so that takes yeah, away. And you made that point. Just to throw this out there, brother Gian, yeah. uh, to interject real quick. Um, I was actually gonna 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 say that exactly. Per, um, uh, namely, we are going to have to qualify every term. Yes, persons needs to be qualified, but but we what we need to do is we need to find the best term. That is that that all Christians on every level can use, and and furthermore, we need to we're going to have to whatever that term is qualify it Absolutely. properly, right? Give it its its definitions, um, explain it within the context of the Trinity, and as you said, um, subsistences. I mean, how many people? How many people could even say it? Could memorize <laughs> right. it? Right? right. I mean, it's not to be condescending, but there. However, you look at this. There's going to be a large swath of people that are that are not going to adopt that term. Right. That are that are rightful, you know, true Orthodox Christians. Right. Yeah. Correct. And so I say persons is perfect, especially when qualified by one being, one essence. And it's just going to be better than anything else you can possibly put in there, except for maybe subsistences. But as we said, that's never going to catch. Um, but right. if you think about any other term that's been suggested in the past by heretics, uh, one, th- right. they were posited by heretics. So modes or manifestations or roles. What you right. realize in any right. other term that could possibly be used is that it is it, it implies um, temporariness or it implies yeah, a, be- exactly. a beginning to the distinction. So three modes or three manifestations. Well, if we right. see the way that that's used in Scripture— for example, God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest. That be, that happened at right. a point in time. But with the persons, the persons don't come to exist at a point in time. The persons eternally exist within the one being that is God. So manifestations out the window, and also heretics use it's it temporary, today. It's temporary, right? Right, and it's temporary. No, but the relate the- it denotes, which is why, which is why true modalists will adopt that term. Right, exactly. They they do. They love the term yeah. manifestations. Um, they love the term roles. For example, they will only view the distinctions within the Godhead as being those of the economy. In many ways, it's kind of like social trinitarianism. Although they would obviously right. have many different disagreements, but they view the, the the distinction between the persons as not being real. It's really just something that we. Um, it's just the way we see it from our point of uh, from our point of view. Right. But th- this is. So what about this, brother Gian? What if I threw this out there? Uh, what if somebody said, "Why use extra biblical language at all? I don't want. I'm only going to use the 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 Bible's terms, only words from the Bible." What would you respond with? I would say then we can't ever talk about anything ever. Like like if you can't even say Bible, you can't even say Bible, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't even say Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, that's just a ridiculous way of thinking. It's impossible. It's impossible to not. You know, if you're going to expound on scripture, I mean, you cannot preach if you can't use words that are not in scripture. Because what am That's I supposed to do? That's the job of the preacher. Right. Good point. What, what what am I supposed to do when I'm preaching out of I'm preaching out of the book of Hebrews right now, for example? What am I supposed to do? Just read the verse? No. I expound on on the on the, on the scripture. I expound on the pes- on the passage on the text, and that requires me using other words that are not in the text, right? So right, right extra biblical language. So far, it is as it is not anti biblical. It's just fine. Right, right. Right. Okay. 
Um, so <clears throat> we talked about the Nicene Creed. I got distracted for a moment. Did you hit on the Athanasian, Ath- on Athanasius and the Athanasian Creed? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. We, we touched on it for a second, but okay. So I, I missed that point, but that's where the Trinity shield came from. So uh, the yes. symbol, right? That is the the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Ghost or is not the Holy Spirit. Um, but all three are God. Now most people, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of people, and especially with the controversy that took place a few years back, um, and and some within um, a certain sect within, as we said, uh, Independent Baptists, they would view that. They would. They themselves would define that from their own current understanding, mm-hmm. okay, um, of reflecting or being a representation of the social trinity. Yeah. But just just to understand, brother Gian, is that is that the case? Is that when it was created? Was it social trinitarian um, in its understanding or its 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 ideology? No, absolutely not. So that shield does not go back to the 17th or 18th century. It actually goes back <laughs> to the 4th century with the Athanasian Creed. Right. It is literally called the Shield of Athanasius. So it is supposed to be a visual representation of what the the Athanasian Creed teaches. And, you know, I've already... Right, of a concept. Sorry? Yeah, right, of a concept, too. Of a concept. Right, right. It's, it's, sometimes people, <clears throat> they, they lack the ability to think in an abstract manner. But it's just, it, it is only meant to represent... Uh, or, or to symbolize to us um, uh, the concept of, of these distinctions, but also unity at the very same time. Obviously, God himself is not is, – it's not possible to be able to depict uh, the Lord and the persons of the Trinity. God is spirit. So, yeah, sorry about that, but continue. What were you saying? Yeah, yeah. So, so that is literally called the Shield of Athanasius. And so if we go if, – if anybody wants to take a look at that, it's very solid doctrine on the Trinity. And, and as I, I kind of alluded to it earlier – the fact that the distinctions between the persons is not found in any attribute. It goes out of its way to hammer this point. Where, as I stated earlier, the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty, and yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. Right. The, the point being is that you can't distinguish between, if I'm looking at Almightiness, I'm not going to find a difference between God, Fa- uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I could only right. find the distinctions by their relation to one another. You know, the father of none, the son eternally begotten, the Holy Spirit eternally right. proceeding. And so that is what that shield is representing. The father is not the son because the father is of none and the son is begotten of him. The son is not the Holy Spirit because the son is the one from whom the spirit proceeds, so on and so forth. And yet they are one being, one God with one mind and one will. That is what that shield right, is representing. Right. Yeah, the will and the mind, they are seated within the nature Correct. They're seated within the essence of God. They're not within the persons. That's where it it begins to 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 look like polytheism. And and we understand this. It just this is this is scriptural. Um, we understand this from from many different passages in the Bible. We could even use uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, not mm-hmm. even just with with Christ, but Christ when he speaks to his disciples, he speaks of uh, the flesh, the weaknesses of the flesh. Right. We see the desires of the flesh throughout the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. So desires or wills, these are synonymous. Uh, you know, uh, a will and and uh, a desire would come from that nature, Correct. which is the flesh, right? So it, it, with, with, with that, we can make perfect sense of different passages throughout Scripture when Christ is incarnate. That is, he took on a second nature, so we should expect uh, there to be uh, uh, a second will with that second nature, Correct. second desires. And this is why, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane with Christ, when he prays, he says, not my will, but thine be done. Mm-hmm. Many social Trinitarians will point to that and say, see, there's there's two wills mm-hmm. within the Godhead, within the Trinity. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, co- I mean, this is why you know, having a good... Um, the foundation of, of hermeneutics is important. Right. The context is Christ struggling, right. first of all. Right. So w- this struggle is coming from that that added, you might say, second nature that he's that he has taken on. Mm-hmm. He it's in this case he's struggling right in the flesh, in the with flesh, the weaknesses of the flesh, and that's that will of that second nature that's there that we can see. Christ was truly a man. He was really he didn't oh, go through the motions. He wasn't. He, he wasn't. Took on. So he didn't have God DNA in the flesh. 
No, I no? don't think he did. I don't think he did. Yeah, I don't. I don't uh, subscribe to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. What you're saying is totally true. And if you look back at church history, um, the third, I, I believe it was the third Council of Constantinople, it hashed this out. So there was there were um, heretics known as uh, monothelites who believed that Christ only had one will. And, and the problem with that is, as you've stated, is that there is friction between. Christ right. and the Father at times, and if you if you're going to hold that He only has one will, well then now you've created two wills within the Godhead because you would presumably have to say right. that that's part of the divine nature, right? That if, if He only has one will and Christ is God, then that's part of the divine will, and the divine will is at odds with the Father's will. Now you've created two wills within God, and this was considered heresy. And this is the Third Council right. of Constantinople, I believe it was in the sixth century, uh, somewhere along those lines. And so what it did was it said no. Christ has two distinct natures, uh, not separate. They're inseparably united in the one person that is Christ. Right. And each of the natures, the human and divine, has a will that it's pro that is proper to its own. So there's a divine will, which is one and the same with the Father, because he is right. one being with the Father. And then there's the human will, which is distinct from his divine will. And this, uh, right. this helps us to understand a lot of these passages. And so all that to say that historically, will is has been grounded, has been viewed as being grounded in nature and not in person. Right. Because it was stated that these two natures were inseparably united in the one person that is Christ, that is the Son. And so he had one, there was one one in person, but he was two in nature, meaning that he had two different wills. And so we think of God as being one divine nature, therefore he has one will. So whether or not you agree with, with the council, that's not the point. The point is that historically this is the way that Christians have viewed these things. Right. Inadvertently, you're kind of giving us an example of the importance of using the correct language because you were, you were using the word separate uh, in the context of the Trinity, right. uh, inseparable, separate, and then distinction, but you weren't using them entirely uh, synonymously. No. Right? No, no. <laughs> right. So, so people stand up and they teach the Trinity, and uh, they're— yeah, uh, you know, and they will uh, use a phrase, for example, that they are three separate persons. Yeah, that, is there a problem with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That ought. <laughs> did, did you cringe just now? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't even help it. I knew you <laughs> were just saying it as an example, and I was already shaking my head. Yeah, it, look, yeah. And, and to be fair, a lot of actual Orthodox Trinitarian people who are actually Orthodox Trinitarians uh, will say it like that sometimes. What, what what I mean by that is like well-meaning people that probably don't know much about the Trinity, but they are Trinitarian in their heart. Let's put right, it that way. That's a, that's a good disclaimer to make that they don't really – there are a lot of people that aren't aware of this. And I, as I said before, this isn't to be snooty. Like I, yeah. I've had my own issues. The whole point is to help people, you know, and that's what we should do as Christians, right? As we learn and grow in a certain area, we are to edify other people right. with whatever, you know, uh, you know uh, understanding or skills or whatever it may be that we've grown in. Yeah, exactly. So uh, separate and distinct – uh, they're they're you know these these are these are not synonymous terms and they are not to be used to describe especially the three persons of the Trinity because it creates too much distance between the persons right and that is that it violates the oneness of God Absolutely. there is truly one God that one God is Trinity He mm. is Trinity exactly um yeah and uh, so the so we're, we're the how, how do you know isn't it just isn't history just unknowable. Right? How do you know that they weren't social trinitarians? Right? How do you know that Athanasius didn't believe in the social trinity? You know, um, or the Nicene Creed didn't represent the social trinity. How do you know this? You know what's funny? There, there are a lot. There are some of these. Um, I like to call them historical agnostics, where they really just think that you can't know anything in history. Now, uh, and and some of these have have come from. I already knew what you meant by that term when I heard it, because there's so many people out there today yeah. that that fall into that category. Right. And particularly when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, certain people that I have uh, covered in in my channel um, have alluded, have have kind of alluded to, have kind of expressed that we don't really know what anyone really believes in history. That's ridiculous, and especially when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, because it is the one thing that everybody wrote about all the time, everywhere. <laughs> so this this is it does it's not in their favor. It's not you know to say that we don't yeah. really know what anyone believed. It's so thoroughly documented. 
Um, we have all these councils, and, and I keep saying that, and I, what I don't want to be, anyone to think is that I view these things as authoritative, but it is documentation of what people were believing and thinking back then. We have right. many of we have all of Athanasius' writings uh, preserved. Uh, we can read them today, and we can see that, as a matter of fact, he often is, is uh, scoffing at the idea that there are three different minds and wills, and he's often talking about divine simplicity and, and stuff like that. We have all of these writings available to us and reading up to even the Reformation, people clearly still holding to um, the classical uh, Orthodox view of the Trinity. I mean, it's well documented. I mean, there's nothing else I could really say. I mean, just Google. <laughs> do, do you have a sample? I believe I believe that we talked about this a little bit. Do you have a sample of, for example, um, I can't remember which which uh, you know of the of the bishops. Uh, I believe it was a, one of the Gregories. Then there's more than one from Nicaea. Do you have that sample in front of you of one of the examples where we could see from their own writings oh, right, right. in detail that that they they believed that there is one will and one mind in the Godhead, and it's the obvious conclusion you can tell that when writing they believe that it is just the assumption because they're battling as we said their historical context is with uh those that are rejecting the deity of christ right so they the assumption is that will and mind are grounded as you put it in the nature right so so uh, i think what you're getting at is that some people have posited that the cappadocians meaning the greg gregory nazances gregory of nyssa um and Basil right. the Great, that they were like proto-social Trinitarians. And this is all really based off, well, really, you can't find anything that Basil and Gregory uh, uh, of Nyssa said that was social Trinitarian at all. They're kind of just always lumped together. They're called the Cappadocian Fathers. But there's this is all based off of one thing that Gregory Nazantius wrote one time, which he used the analogy of uh, common humanity and different persons within that common humanity where really he was just trying to get at the fact that god is three in one way and one in another so he's not three in one in the same way uh because that would constitute a contradiction obviously but he was saying that god is three in one way and one in another and and the reason we know that he is not trying to say that well there's three different beings within uh what can be called humanity and he's not trying to uh uh, say that that's what the Trinity is like is because he has explicit writings where he's talking about there being one divine will, right. one divine mind. So, for example, in his um, expo in his exegesis of John chapter six, where it says, "I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me." His commentary on that is, "Well, of course, He didn't come down to do His own will. He has no will outside uh, uh, that is different from the Father's will. For as we have one Godhead, we have one mind, we have one will." <clears throat> so and that was a direct quote right there that's a great yeah that's a, almost verbatim yeah yeah because we have one mind or i'm sorry because we have one godhead we have one mind right one will is that correct 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 right so you notice the assumption that's built into it i mean it's clear that that even even because he's battling like i said with in his context um those that would reject the deity of christ right the Arians. Uh, the closest modern day would be, yeah, the Arian would be, modern day would be Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they. so he says, because we have one Godhead, we have one mind, one will. It's just the logical conclusion. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the Nicene Creed, they hold to what would be the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity, and, and namely one of the main differing points of, of the two positions, social Trinitarianism and classical Trinitarianism, is uh, w where that mind and that will is grounded. They would hold to the classical view of the Trinity, yeah. and that is that, yeah, that that the mind and the will um, is, uh, is grounded in the nature of God. There is one mind and one will, and that's not grounded in the persons. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt, yeah. Without a doubt, right. And then, so we, we work our way through history. Is there anyone that... Um, that would hold to social trinitarianism as you put it proto uh, a proto social trinitarian throughout history you mean yes th before the 18th century the closest you can get to what could be considered social trinitarianism were people that were not trinitarians at all as you would keep alluding to the arians <laughs> be because they, you know they they viewed this you know to uh, another word for arianism was uh, it's a form of subordinationism so viewing um uh, the father, the son, as being a subordinate being to the father, which you could find certainly elements of that in social trinitarianism. Yeah, and 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 um, earlier you you referred to within the Nicene Creed, 
that anyone who's even vaguely familiar with it would would uh, 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 call to mind. We have not, you know, so the God, God the Father is Almighty, Son is Almighty, the Holy Spirit is Almighty, mm-hmm. but there's not three Almighties. There's yet one right. Almighty. Um, that that that's the whole principle, right? There, right? Right. There, that, there cannot not be that subordination God the in the Godhead. Almighty. Right. And, and, and interestingly, right, uh, in Revelation chapter number one, just as an example, they, they, the, in the New World Translation, a Jehovah's Witness, they, they attempt to disconnect uh, Christ in, there in Revelation one from being that almighty that's speaking. Mm. If you're familiar with that. Yeah, no, so well, they, not, so not exactly. T- but yeah, that would make sense that they would uh, that they would want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, uh, when it's you know red letter for Christ speaking in Revelation one, um, yeah, they they go back and forth, and they like they they just drop some black letters right there where you know Christ continues to speak, and they just make it God the Father speaking. Interjecting for a second. Christ That's funny. Refers to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just a parenthetical statement that he just yeah right. Yeah. 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 So you can see you see the overlap is one of the points. Like they even Jehovah's Witnesses today attempt to do that. Yeah. Um, one of the pushback that they gave at the time was that, you know, um, the in the same way, that's probably a good way to frame it. In the same way that God the Father is almighty in in nature, in attributes, in qualities, every way, the Son is almighty in that very same way, as is the Holy Spirit. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, there's no difference. So, there's not a different instance of almightiness or a lesser al- uh, almightiness that is obviously contradictory. Um, it is the same um, instance of almightiness. Right. So ontologically, you, earlier, and you define that for anybody who doesn't know what that means, to speak into the nature uh, of of God in this in this sense. Um, there is no different. There is no subordination. There is no difference in. You know uh, the almightiness, right. right, of God the Father and the Son. Right? <clears throat> okay, uh, who today? <clears throat> who today would hold to? And we we've touched on this a little bit, so we can, if if we need to, we can kind of skim over it quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, who today would believe what? Right? What segment of Christians would hold to the classical Trinity and know that they believe it or don't know? And you can kind of explain that. And and who would who would uh, you know push or propagate? I'm going to show my bias there. The social Trinity. Well, um, the if we're talking about true social trinitarianism. It, it as I stated, it's mainly an ivory tower doctrine. Uh, it's held by liberal theologians and higher institutions of learning. Um, it's not going to really be found in its true form amongst uh, actual churchgoers. Now, if you're talking about classical trinitarianism, this is going to be upheld by all of your conservative Protestant denominations and traditions, whether that be confessional Lutherans or Presbyterians or Reformed Baptists or conservative Methodists. Uh, and really, this is because they hold to their confessions. So like the Westminster Confession of Faith for the Presbyterians, the London Baptist Confession for the Reformed Baptists, or the Augsburg Confession for the Lutherans. And those are very strong classical Trinitarian documents that they hold to. Um, And even if you look at Rome and Eastern Orthodoxy, um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, with all its faults, actually has a perfect, great, uh, you know, section on the Trinity. And it's a classical Trinitarian. Are you saying saying that Rome has the right Trinity? Yes, Rome has the right Trinity. And so (laughs) it just so happens that Rome has the right Trinity, as does Eastern Orthodoxy. It does have some differences because they don't believe in the filioque, meaning they don't believe that right. that the that the spirit proceeds from both the father and the son. Eastern Orthodoxy believes that he only proceeds from the father. Um, and so there is differences like that, but as far as viewing God as one being right. with one mind and one will and viewing the, the persons as being defined by their relation to one another, um, that is going to be upheld by Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, but if we're talking about uh, who holds to social Trinitarianism, as I stated, no one really uh, except these fringe groups we keep alluding to. But the average person, probably in your evangelical average evangelical church, or the average pastor, I should say, there's a difference here. We need to distinguish between clergy and laity. The average evangelical preacher, and I just mean like your average non-denom, or even, um, I hate to say it, like your Southern Baptist, or even independent Baptist, is going to is gonna hold to like a hybrid version, somewhere halfway between social Trinitarianism and classical Trinitarianism. Um, and so... Um, 
So to get to how the average pastor would understand it, um, it's going to be this hybrid view. And a perfect example of this would be the eternal functional subordination controversy. This kind of erupted in 2016 when this, uh, the, the primarily two theologians, Wayne Grudem and Bruce Ware, these are like evangelical types. Um, they came out with systematic theologies and they're very prominent theologians in their circle. And they came out purporting this doctrine of the eternal functional subordination of the son, which affirms that the son is God, but he is eternally subordinate. He eternally submits to the father from all eternity past. So not just in the economy or in the incarnation, they believe this to be the right. case from all eternity at intra. And, and, and if you see actually um, the initial pushback against them, was that this would imply two different minds or wills in the Godhead. So even people within their circles, right. which is generally like a reform type circle, they were saying, well, right. what are you implying here? That there's two different minds or wills? Right. Um, it's the logical conclusion. Right. That this is one of the things that people lack oftentimes is that when you, when you, when you posit, there's no way around it. Right. Uh, you know, obviously, we've been created with the ability to reason, which is what the being in the image of God means. The ability to reason, to work through things logically. Oh, it doesn't mean that we have a body like God. God has one? No, no, it doesn't mean that, brother. We're going to have to talk offline, you know, about that. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah but um, yeah, man. Uh, so, yeah. So, the, what was the point that I was making? Just, I lost track of what I was saying. You're talking about how uh, how it's a logical conclusion of, of you turn, you know, you're saying that oh, one right. submits to the other, that implies a different yeah, yeah, will. Yeah, exactly. I was I was just gonna throw something out there like philosophically that people lack today in it's like they, they it's like they do not have the ability or they they don't see the importance of uh, understanding what is the logical conclusion of what you're positing here yeah yeah so yeah, so you know the idea that Christ has a body that's what you said yeah the, that was one of the examples the idea that Christ has a body in eternity past yeah. it's I mean there's I mean I could think of five different problems right now where would you put it where right you know? before time and space was right. created and 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 did it did it come from adam you know is he truly right. you know the second adam right yeah yeah it, it would. yeah i mean before adam was ever created it's like where would you put it before time space and matter existed mm -hmm. you know and and then furthermore is he the second adam with right there you get into you start to see from a logical conclusion of one you know statement you see how this begins to cause problems in other doctrines with other doctrines like the atonement exactly correct the atonement you knew what i was yeah yeah, yeah. so to. like exactly. no, no longer is he really truly our representative um as, yeah. a, as a true human now he's just can he be a proper substitute right. for us as an atonement right if this, if this is part if of the man. of the divine nature because this is as how always as he's existed we're going go, getting off on a caveat here because nobody really believes this except one group right, <laughs> but uh right. but yeah another nevertheless hey but they can learn from them they can learn from the, the you know these are in samples right right these are uh, yeah, that they shouldn't follow right right, right. <laughs> later on from the philosophy of it right but but getting back to to logical conclusions this was actually the pushback that that wayne grudem and bruce ware got uh they, they, because it was they were saying like wait a minute if you're saying that the son's eternally subordinate to the father that means there's two different wills two different minds in the godhead now to their credit uh grudem and Ware both rejected that they said no this submission somehow occurs within the one mind and will of god um and so they denied three different wills and i'm glad that they did uh, but really it's incoherent right. so uh right. you know because how do you get there like if you have a submission going on that that of necessity creates different wills but this is an example of what would be a hybrid form of classical trinitarianism with social trinitarianism um some people would also use the phrase three centers of consciousness that people that actually lean right. classical, but we use this, um, and this term has definitely has social leanings, centers of consciousness, but, but then they would affirm that, the, that these centers of consciousness somehow occur within the one divine mind. Um, and right. obviously again, which is incoherent, which is incoherent, right? The, the logical occlusion, it, it, the best way to put it is that the logical conclusion of what they're saying is heretical, but they themselves avoid that conclusion through a logical inconsistency. Yeah, this is probably a time to throw in a caveat as well that that uh, even these these fringe groups of independent Baptists, mm. you know, you know uh, we don't we don't believe, uh, you know, at least I don't. Okay, I don't, you know, brother Gian, uh, truly, you know, you could you can give your statement about it, but um, we don't believe that a lot of them they don't they don't realize the logical conclusions of many things that they're saying. I, you know. I, I don't believe that many of them are polytheists, right? Um, but nonetheless, the statements that they're making are in line with 
polytheism, and they lead to polytheism, just like the positing of Christ having a body in eternity leads to a, a you know a a logical impossibility. Yeah, so so I would agree with you. The, I would say the overwhelming majority of them are not truly polytheist in their hearts. But obviously, that is the the only lo- and obviously that particular group gets way closer to polytheism than would someone that holds solely to the eternal functional subordination of the sun. Um, it, but you know, you start right. saying you know three different bodies and and three different minds and wills and all of this sort of thing. I mean, there's very little to keep you from polytheism. Um, but nonetheless, I do believe that many of them are not truly polytheists um, in their hearts. Right. Let's put it that way. Right. Okay, so uh, there would be a hybrid. You kind of mentioned the uh, the controversy, and that's what I'm sure you knew, but just in case anybody didn't know about the more recent controversies that I referred to just in broader Christianity um, over you know Christendom over the past century. Or so, um, there's been a couple of times where things like that has erupted. Now that's much more modern uh, in 2016, where uh, specifically what was what was the the center uh, theme or the center topic during that time was um, the eternal uh, subordination of the sun. Right. Right. And and from there they kind of uh, they 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 fleshed out a few different topics that that would connect to. Right. Right. So the average Christian understanding of the Trinity today would be a hybrid. That's the I, I would correct. say that's the average uh, understanding of the Christian pastor. Um, okay. That, I think, is different when you're talking about the average layman in the pew. Uh, as a matter of fact, right. to be frank, I think that the average layman is actually going to lean a little bit modalist. Um, now, now I don't want to say they're not, I'm not to say that they're modalist heretics or anything like that, because they, they might affirm certain modalistic language if they're asked on the spot. So a lot of them might be tempted right. to say, and analogies. Right. Jesus is the father, they might say. Right. And, and really what they mean by that, it's, they're not saying that because uh, they are modalist heretics, but it, it's really because, for example, if you were to tell them like true, the true um, con- uh, uh, conclusions of modalism, if you were to say, hey, do you believe that Jesus has always existed from eternity past distinct from the father? They would affirm unequivocally. Yes. If you were to tell them that Jesus has not eternally existed as the second person of the Trinity, th- that would be uh, horrific to them. Um and yet they would still use the language of Jesus being the father. But I think what they're really getting at is that intuitively, the average layman understands that God is one being and, and that right. the three persons do not constitute three you know, distinct autonomous agents. Uh, and they're really trying right. to get into the fact that Jesus is the same being as the father, um, even if they in- incorrectly yeah. put it as Jesus is the father. Right, exactly. And, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier that I had made errors along these lines. And I think it, just to, to uh, kind of toss this out there too, I think one of the reasons is because we today, if, we don't, if Christianity does not define the term persons for us, we will naturally just plug in there the only interpretation of persons that we use on a daily basis. Yeah. Right. The only one that we're familiar with. Thus, uh, without it being defined for us, we hear repeatedly, as every Christian does, one God, three persons, right? They're going to have some, some misunderstandings when it comes to the, you know, what that means in the, the personhood, mm-hmm. right, of, of the Trinity. But then also they understand over here at the very same time that, that God is one. From doing their own Bible reading, they realize that there's one mind, one will. So th- there'll, be, there'll be a lot of confusion there in that they'll say, well, Jesus is the Father in that, well, there's one being. Mm-hmm. You know, that must mean that Jesus is the Father. But then you know, they, they also respond, you know, wrongly to the persons oftentimes. If you were to try to work through, okay, right. what do you mean by three persons? And this is why a lot of people today would reject the term persons. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've seen this quite a few times, honestly, in Baptist circles, all sorts of independent Baptist circles, where you just go to, you'll go to their website, the Statement of Faith, and you can tell that they are refusing to use the term persons. And I did this mm. even during my pastorship. There, there was a point in, in my pastorship. And where they're, you know, you'll go to the website and the Statement of Faith of a particular Baptist pastor, and they, you could tell that they just do not want to use the term person. So this is why it's vital today for pastors to use the proper language to exposit, explain these things, what does it mean, define it, because ultimately the layman will be confused as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
And it's core to who God is. He is Trinity. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that kind of deals with it. What, what's a good analogy, real quick, before we, you know, uh, get into the last two points? It'll be kind of quick. Or the last couple of points. What's a good analogy? What would you use? I know that we didn't have this prepared necessarily, but what's a good analogy, brother Gian? A good analogy of the Trinity. Well, <laughs> obviously, that's always going to fall short, and I don't like using them. But right. if I'm going to use one, um, I'm going to use the one that a lot of the early church fathers used, and they would say that. It, it, the Father and the Son, so this would be more difficult to extrapolate it unto the Spirit, but just so you get an analogy of how we see the distinction between the persons, is li- uh, light and its brightness. Right, That would be the way that, that, uh, that would be the analogy that was often used of the Father and the Son. The, fa- uh, the Father is the light, the Son is his brightness. You, you, so it, yeah, it exactly. is the same essence, the same substance, um, but they are distinct. The light and the brightness right. are distinct, but it's ultimately the same essence the same thing right right so that you know i and don't this, this is an analogy that scripture gives us oh yeah, right Hebrews yeah 1. it is an analogy that scripture gives us. yeah yeah yeah, yeah the it, brightness yeah, of I, his I glory to be honest i think it's the greatest it's the yeah and uh I, you know uh some of the church fathers even have have uh they've they've connected the holy spirit with it in that the they that obviously the father everything is 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 uh of or from the Father, mm-hmm. and He is the you know the core of what you know the the Son, like the solar Son, right? right. Uh, not Father and Son, but the the Son, and then the brightness would be Christ, mm-hmm. and the warmth of that would be the Holy Spirit. And there's even a connection to right. that, right? Right? Yeah. So that, yeah, and that yeah. And now that I'm thinking of it, this is how a lot of the a lot of the um uh, of the confessions in the Protestant Reformation, a lot of the writings of the reformers, and even of the Anabaptists. Uh, they put it this way. I, I'm just thinking of one of the Anabaptist analogies that is used in one of their confessions of faith. I want to say it was Dirk Phillips, uh, an Anabaptist preacher in the uh, 17th century. He put it. He used the analogy of a flame of fire. So he was saying the Trinity is not three separate right. flames, right? Don't think it's right. one flame. And then the Father is like the actual, um, let's say the the actual flame. Um, Right. Then the, the sun is like the brightness, and then the Holy Spirit is like the heat. That's mm-hmm. actually the analogy he used right, as well. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think Jonathan Edwards used it as well. That's right. I believe it, it may not have been the early church fathers where I read it, but I think it was Jonathan Edwards who who used that. Right. But that's a perfect yeah, way of yeah, putting this it. This is this is the eternal relation of origins. We can see that in it. We can see we can see uh, the uh, the inseparable operations Correct. in this. Yeah. Right. That that uh, God is Trinity. We can kind of see that seated behind um, the, the, this analogy. Right. So um, you're saying that that the Trinity isn't like uh, uh, a um, like water, right? Um, ice. No, no, that would lean a little modalistic. Um, okay, that would be more of a modalistic explanation. Even though a lot of Christians use it, um, but but if they really try to, uh, and obviously every analogy is going to fall short, but I think there's a lot more that falls short right. in that right. particular analogy than would with yeah. the flame. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay, um, so what is the uh, honestly the significance of the doctrine of the Trinity? The reason why we do a discussion like this, the reason why, and I can tell you, I'm personally invested. This is this is an important topic for me, um, not only uh, be, you know because of controversies that I've been uh, embroiled in in the past, but it, that those help me, and and uh, and it kind of leans into, and we'll touch on this here in just a minute, uh, the importance of church history, mm-hmm. because if I would have known more of church history. Um, if I would have had more of a, a better understanding of my Christian heritage of why the term persons is even here today when in the context and in the conversation where what was his origin what did it what did it mean when it was given to us as I wouldn't have fallen into some of the misunderstandings that I that I've fallen into right. um, myself so what is the significance of the doctrine of the Trinity well the Trinity first of all it, it's a uniquely Christian doctrine it is truly what separates our conception of God from any other monotheistic religion. So you're thinking about uh, Judaism or um, Islam or even Hinduism, which is a lot of people understand that they're actually ultimately monotheists. But the point is that the Trinity is what separates true biblical religion, the religion of the Bible, from any other conception of monotheism. It, it goes and it's, it gets into the core of who God is, who is God. 
And if we want to know who God is, we ought to know that he is Trinity. We ought to know right. what that even means. What does it mean that God is Trinity? Right. And so th that is the significance. It goes down to very knowing the very being who is, who is our God and the way that he not only functions or, or, or acts in eternity past, but in relation to us. He is thoroughly Trinity. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it comes down to when you pray, how do we pray? Right. right. It comes down to our salvation. How is that worked out? Right. Right. Um, praising and worshiping God. How do we do that? Um, the creation of the world. You know, how did that work? Right. Our understanding of how the world came into being, mm -hmm. the, the very fabric of our reality that we live, who we are. Right. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are you know, the significance of the Trinity is um, of yeah, the utmost importance. Right. So, so I think the temptation is sometimes to view the Trinity as like this. Uh, they'll view the Trinity itself, even if somebody is themselves a Trinitarian, they'll view like the particulars as some sort of an ivory tower thing. But in reality, it's very, it's the one thing that I would say, if you're going to get obsessed with, you know, to, to use that term, it, it should be that and justification. I think those are two very vital topics. You know, they're, they're, I mean, I could just yeah. keep on adding, but if we want to talk about like understanding who God is, you know, right, the Trinity, right. you've got, to, you, you know, you should be quote unquote obsessed with the Trinity. You should be wanting to right. look at the particulars insofar as what scripture tells us. And so, because as you stated, and that's not to say that there can't be a point where it gets to right. That, that it is, uh, that, that we're beginning to, you know, navel gaze or, no, of or course. getting into difficulties of uh, that does exist of course just to exists. give a caveat there. Yeah, of course. It yeah. yeah. But, but it's nonetheless, it's a topic um, that we shouldn't quickly say that about, as people do. Today, you, you know, and, and you rightfully respond in the way in which um, we should, and that's because today people don't want to uh, dive into the deep things of God, mm -hmm. right? The things that, that are there for us, the understandings that we can have about God, his nature, and the Trinity. People oftentimes just refer to that as being, you know, um, too deep, uh, uh, too intellectual, a waste of time when— it's 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 tr it's there for us and and it's significant in that we need to know who our god is right and god has revealed himself to us in the bible as we can know him it's not this good point right it's not this abstraction it's not it's not like all of this is is coming about from vain philosophy or something like that it is in scripture right so let, let's with that let's say where is the line of heresy where would you say that someone you know what do you mean by heresy uh, that's probably important to define that term as well but uh, um, you know where is that line of heresy as far as the Godhead is concerned um so I would say that there's a lot of person can get wrong and still be saved um, and ultimately God is the judge we understand there's a lot of people that don't understand the particulars of the Trinity or or, or anything like that. But I would say that the line of heresy, and when I say heresy, I mean like something that puts you outside of the Christian faith. Like if you uh, believe right, this particular right, you thing, go. you are not a Christian, regardless of what you want to call yourself. That It's easy to draw that line on, the, uh, on modalism, for example, because, you know, it's easy to, 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 to see that that's, they're denying the second person of the Trinity, right? And that would constitute, they're denying... The, the you know the son and so that will constitute a denial of the father right and so scripture is clear about that whosoever uh denies the son the same has not the father so if you don't have the father you don't have the son i would say modalism clearly denies the son it denies the second person of the trinity and therefore it doesn't have the father um so that's easy but it's a little bit more difficult i would say to establish that line with social trinitarianism um because it's really kind right. of unprecedented in history Unlike modalism, it's very well known in history, and, and we know where all Christians have historically stood at, on that point. But with social Trinitarianism, it's a bit different. But I guess we can use Mormonism as our example. All right, we will all agree that Mormonism is heresy, right? They're not Christians. Right. So right. I guess what really is the difference between Mormonism and a full-fledged understanding of social Trinitarianism? I mean, you ask the Mormon theologian, and he would say there really isn't any like Blake right. Osser, like we discussed. Yeah, and it's possible for somebody to say something that is that is heresy, but 
but but not really their you know the, the conception of who God is in their heart is something a little bit different. You know, they're, they're ignorant to their words. Right, I, I think that's that true their too. Words obviously. are reflecting a totally different idea. I would I would apply that to both too. I think that's important to throw out there that there are many people that will make like you even alluded to this earlier strong modalistic statements, mm-hmm. um, but nonetheless they're, they themselves being ignorant of of the the terms and how they're used, um, they will in discourse. Describe God in modalistic terms, but nonetheless have have a little bit of a different conception in their heart, and they're trying to guard God's monotheism, correct? Yeah, yeah, his, his I, oneness, and maybe a, a reaction to some social trinitarian leanings that they've heard, things that they've encountered that sound polytheistic, mm-hmm. and they can overreact and go the other direction. And then the same thing would apply, just you know, um, inverted on the other side. Right. I, I guess the best way to put it is this: um, if somebody would have kind of a modalistic leaning or view of the Godhead. And when presented with, I would say, the biblical, classical doctrine of the Trinity, uh, they outright reject it. Then I would say, I I would say that person is probably um, not saved. That person is probably a heretic truly in the heart. Uh, they can hear, yeah. yeah. And if they were to persist in it, because yeah, you know, sometimes right. obviously people it, right. can learn and change, and right, we're, we're, we're I'm factoring that in as well, and that would be the case on the other right. side uh, also. But but I would say that on the other side, uh, on the on the side of polytheism, if truly your conception of God really is that God is the persons of the Godhead are as distinct as you and I are, Pastor, and you really think of the Godhead as me, Pastor Baker, and um my son for example then i mean i i find you know at this point i'm being i think i might be overly charitable <laughs> by saying you're not a heretic um but that's that's <laughs> yeah, my right. conclusion yeah so you know and you made a good point um in relating it to comparing it uh, you know i i hesitate to say contrast but comparing it to uh, the mormon conception of the Godhead, which they don't use the term Trinity. They reject the Trinity. Right. They they say as much, right? right? They they overtly and directly reject the Trinity. They reject persons, and they outright the, – you know, their um, language that they use is that there are three beings. Yep. Yep. They actually understand that, that will and mind are grounded in being. Right. Right? That's where they're seated. That's where they're found. So they would say there are three beings mm-hmm. – the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and they would say that they are one in purpose. One in purpose, yep. And they and they would refer to it as the Godhead, right? So, um, social trinitarianism, uh, you know, in in a frightening way, is very similar to that. When yeah. you begin to hear them describe it, as as the uh, the uh, Mormon scholar you you cited, yeah, um, there's as, very as little noted. to distinguish and he, it. And he identified. Right. Right. And it's 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 one in purpose. It's one in purpose is what that would be. Right. Right. The only, I mean there's very little to distinguish true social trinitarianism from mormonism. The only difference might be found I mean it might be found in the terms, but the definitions are almost exactly the same. So I mean they'll, you know the social trinitarian will use persons, the mormon would just say outright say being. Um the social trinitarian might even say one in essence. But they, really, what they're saying, right, you know, right. but they really what they mean is like, well, they're one purpose or something. So they're really just using different terms, but ultimately the same definition. And I really cannot see right. a difference. Um, and a lot, of, I'm not, I'm not the only one to come with, up with this conclusion. Many have as well. Yeah, it's that's why it's important in conversation to to hear other people out and to define terms, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you're going to have a conversation about something, or you when you listen to a debate that people have, they'll define their terms in the beginning because sometimes you could be using two different words right. for the exact same thought or concept. Right, you're just talking or you could past be each using other. the same word. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's that's why debates begin by defining terms. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So um, they may use some different words here and there, but the the thoughts are you know, uh, or the 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 teachings are very very similar. Now it will end on this, brother Gian. Um, uh, this is extremely important. Where did we go wrong? Was there anything? Real quick, let me throw this out there before the finality. Was there anything that you wanted to add to the topic of the Trinity itself? Was there anything you think we missed that was important? Or I don't think so. I think we've been kind of uh, pretty thorough here. 
Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Okay, so lastly, let, 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 let's say this because one of the things that I want to do is we'll have another discussion and um, maybe we could do it in person here in the next week or so in the, in the studio itself. Yeah. But uh, I, I want to talk more so about the, the, uh, the biblical Oh, there is one thing. Yeah, I just popped in my mind. We, we kind of touched on it, but I wanted to make a definitive statement um, because this has been the line of attack that that certain people from these fringe independent baptist group have tried to make that they they have said that classical trinitarianism is modalism right they've tried to uh, liken it right. to the, the, the to modalism to oneness pentecostal doctrine mm -hmm. now uh what's funny about that is that many of my viewers know this i was raised a oneness pentecostal so i know exactly uh, right. what I, you know what the differences are but when it comes down to it and i alluded to we alluded to this earlier but just to be extremely clear the oneness position, the modalist position, would outright reject that God is essentially, that God is ontologically Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. Right. They might right. say that it, it, most of them would outright reject that the, the Son is, is um, has eternally existed in the past anyway. Uh, that, the, you know, so they, so there's no problem there. There are some um, that might hold to this, this view where, yeah, you could have the three manifestations existing from all eternity and and to to use their very own analogy it's like god puts on a mask he has the mask of the father right. here then the son and i don't have a third thing object here right um to, right. to, 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 right. to, to uh, be the holy spirit but ultimately in that analogy and the way that they understand god even if i would even if they were to say none of them say this but i'm just even to say even if they were to extrapolate that these three manifestations as being from eternity past the only ontological reality there would be the person behind the mask right. not and, and so right. the mask yeah, are not real they do not believe in true distinctions within the nature of exactly God. Exactly. Right. And one of the I, one of the things that I've heard uh, in researching oneness Pentecostalism repeatedly, um, you know, that they, for example, like when you see, you know, some of the great examples of the Trinity appearing in Scripture, like Matthew chapter number three, as you use the term manifestations, that's 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 all that these are. Right. To them, the Father, the Father in three forms. Right. You might say. Yeah. Some of them will put it as uh, the eternal Spirit. So, so there's a, there's slightly different variations within oneness Pentecostalism. Some would say that the Father is the ultimate reality, and then He kind of uh, has the mode of the Son and of the Spirit. Others would say that it's the Spirit, the eternal Spirit, and He manifests Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But whatever, essentially, it's the same thing. Uh, they view that they do not believe that God is ontologically in and of Himself from all eternity that he exists right. as trinity that even if you were to say that the three manifestations have always have, have that god has been manifesting himself, himself this way from all eternity past they don't believe that god must exist that way they don't believe that god right th we would say that god cannot be if he's not trinity because he is trinity yeah he is trinity right, right. and this is why the term persons is a good term right right to, to show right. that there are it, true it, real it, distinctions in god eternally in his being Right. And the, the modalists would reject that. They do not believe that God must exist as Trinity. We affirm that he does. We affirm that these distinctions are true and real. So as to say that the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and yet they are one God. Well, they would not They would not uphold to that. They would say that there's only one, and to use their analogy again, the only reality would be the person behind the mask and not the actual right. mask itself. The mask is just, you know, a, a manifestation of, of sorts. Right, right. So yeah, so you were you were talking about the 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 social trinity uh, slinging the accusation at classical orthodox trinitarians that they are oneness or modalists right. um, because they what they want to do is they want they want to kind of um, uh, recalibrate the spectrum mm -hmm. which right which they don't realize that throughout history it's there's a reason why it's called the classical orthodox trinity this is what all christians have believed and when there were battles with oneness modalism social trinitarianism didn't exist right it was the classical orthodox Trini trinitarians throughout history that believe in one mind one will the way that it's been described and explained uh, in this podcast that were denouncing sibelius 
Uh, Correct. Um, what, what, what were some of the other? I can't remember their names off the top of my head right now, but uh, there were Praxius. There were other heretics throughout history that held to this oneness modalist view. They were the ones calling them oneness. They were the ones. They were the ones that that denounced that as right. Heresy. In other in other words, it was classical Trinitarians that came up with the term modalism. Mo- yeah, modalism and oneness yeah. exactly. So, so, yeah. So, for example, no- so the Johnny come lately social trinitarian wants to come in and steal right. right that that they want to recalibrate the system and then look back at the classical view and say you're a oneness. It's right. like what in the world? Right, right. We've been battling oneness modalism. We're the ones that denounced it as oneness modalism. So, a great example, another great example in history of this would be that of Calvin's Geneva. So, Calvin, John Calvin, right. unambiguously a classical trinitarian, and famously. Miguel Cervantes, who was a modalist, yeah. um, very you know, very similar to the modern oneness Pentecostals, he was famously burned to death in Calvin's Geneva. So Calvin literally put this guy. Well, not literally, because there's a little more nuance there. Um, Calvin actually tried to get him uh, not off from execution, but from not being so inhumanely killed. But and Calvin, a lot of people think of Calvin as being like the king of Geneva or something like that. That's not exactly true. That's not true at all, actually. But whatever. Uh, but to put it simply, Calvin uh, consented to this guy's death. Calvin being a classical Trinitarian, this guy being a modalist, he put him to death. Right? A modalist right, was put right. to death in Calvin's Geneva. So what, what was right. he putting him to death for? For having the same view as him? Obviously, that's ridiculous. Right, exactly. Right. Obviously, there's there's a there's a large. He's not just kick him out kicking him out of the city. Even he's not even just saying, hey, you know, we have our differences and disagree. There's clearly a large disagreement when it comes to the the understanding of the Godhead. Right. Yeah. So the the idea that they come in, they steal all the terms persons. Right. They steal the idea of essence being. Right. They and then they turn to the classical view that's been held by Christians for. 2000 years those that have been battling and fighting oneness modalism for two millennia mm-hmm. and then call those people oneness modalists right. it's like what in the world and world and class way, gaslighting Trinity, yeah yeah world class gaslighting yeah. exemplary of it and and by the way the you know the social trinitarians you don't own the the trinity shield that's ours right that's ours right? give it back stop using that, it that's Stop! Please stop, stop using it. Yeah, you can come up with your with your own Trinity shield, yeah. right? But uh, yeah, they'll. Um, I, I don't know how that they would have. They just have to knock the lines off, right? To just uh, well, oh, they, uh, yeah, yeah, didact the lines is God. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know how they would do it yeah. exactly, but that. But that. I, I have seen it done by the, drawing three little alien bodies on a on a whiteboard. Right, right. <laughs> three alien bodies, yeah. right? Silo- three but they're the same color. Yeah. They're all like green or something. So that's what makes yeah, them that's, one. That's the, that's the Yeah, that's the distinguishing factor from polytheism, right? Right, right. That, that it's one. Yeah, yeah one I color. guess. <laughs> yeah, and being different colors, I guess it's like one is the almighty. You know, the second is mighty. And maybe the Holy Spirit's also mighty. Maybe that's what they're going for there in that social trinity view. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, uh, that's an important point to make. I'm glad that you brought that up. That it is um you, you can't just, just come in like gaslighting. You can't just come in and uh reframe, redefine the whole and then the all the terms, the whole conversation, this Johnny come lately as I put it earlier, and then look at the classical view that Christians have held to for two thousand years and say that that, that is a position of oneness or modalism right it's ridiculous that's a real good point okay la- lastly so that we can wrap this up brother gian as you said we were thorough that's a good thing maybe i'll split it into two parts i'm not sure just yet but uh where did we go wrong yeah, that's important because if there's all this this confusion and if we have church history as our you know where did we go wrong in all of this well speaking from um an in- as an independent baptist um I'm going to say that in our circles, we went wrong by this, uh, by a rejection of intellectualism. Um, And and so we become like an anti-intellectual movement. And some of that has been because we're overzealous for having scripture alone as our authority, which is fine and good. That's a good thing. But an unintended consequence of this is that we detach ourselves from church history. And so as you stated earlier, we read 
the Bible in a bubble, right? It's just me and my Bible and none of this philosophy or those creeds or anything like that. And the assumption is that w when we do that, when we read our Bible alone, we're going to do so somehow without any influence of philosophy or tradition from our contemporary times. And of course, this is absurd. Uh, what actually tends to happen is that we reject the philosophical and the, the metaphysical categories and the logical conclusions of Christians before us. And instead, we, we read the Bible through the lens of modern philosophical categories, right. modern metaphysics, and we don't even realize it. We think we're being unbiased because we're not. Yeah, you, yeah. Right. But really, we're, 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 we're no the biggest slaves neutral. to tradition when we do that because we're not even aware that we're operating under them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's no like it is impossible for you to be neutral. Like you, you weren't just born, uh, you know, with, in just you know, with just completely this white slate with no influences, no factors in your life. You have an environment. You have a particular time in which you live, and you know, people wanting to reject the term "persons" is a good example of that. They're like, I would never use, you know, that that term because mm -hmm. what it means. You, you know, you mean what it means in this context, right? So you have a definition of it too, right? right. So right. not you know allowing it in the the historical context. It's because you're not familiar with that, and to you it sounds it sounds wrong or odd because you are yeah uh, imposing this other definition. That's a really good point. Right. I, I would say that that was that's that's one of the main things that has led us into all of these modern heresies. Um, and, and you see this this is the case with social trinitarianism, for example, where. Um, they, you know, people who hold to some hybrid of this, even they are viewing the Trinity through the lens of modern philosophical categories. Again, going back to Kant and, and no Hegel, um, they're viewing, um, you know, the, the, that something they're re rejecting this idea of true essence, that something is only true as I experience it. And this has, you know, bled into our understanding of the Trinity. So this idea that we can just completely read the Bible in a bubble and not influenced by anything or anyone else is false. It's a lie. And so if I am, if we understand that we're always going to be influenced by someone, why not be influenced by the Christians in the past? Why not consciously, because you, whether consciously or unconsciously, you are influenced by people and ideas and yeah. thoughts. And so why not? If that's the case, if it's the case that no matter what I do, I'm going to be influenced in some, on some level by other things, why not choose consciously to be influenced by Christians and Christian history? Right, exactly, and I think you started to hit on this there. The, those that that would hold to the social trinity, um, they have no idea that the name of it is the social trinity, and that right. this is a modern teaching, and that you didn't just come up with this formula all on your own. Right, you are a product of the time, and uh, you know there's there's just that ignorance there. It's it's you you know it's either conscious right which was what we would hope mm -hmm. or you're just you're just kind of passive and you don't even know you're taking things in yeah you have no idea that you're just a product and you have to tell them hey what you actually believe is social trinitarianism right. this is not something that has been believed throughout church history it's it can't be found anywhere right and i think really what the problem with with this why uh baptists are going to tend to shy away from church history is that we it's almost like we think that if we we start looking at church history it's like, oh, well, then we have to just embrace all of these false doctrines and Roman Catholicism because they were all Roman Catholics or something like that. And, and this is just right. like, this is not true whatsoever, right? To say that all of the early church was Roman Catholic and all this, this is just, un, you're ignorant of history. And, right. and it's also, right. um, and, and so what ends up being viewed instead, what, what ends up being the predominant view of independent Baptists is like this um, trail of blood theory, which cannot be proven. I mean, that's the whole premise of it that you right. can't prove it. We just assume right. that there's always been people that believe exactly like independent Baptists all uh, from the first century. But uh, are you telling me that the Paulicians were not independent Baptists, brother G. Oh man, <laughs> the Paulicians. <laughs> yeah. I heard about that one recently. <laughs> no, the Paulicians didn't even believe that the God of the old Testament was the, the, was they believed it was an evil God, for example. And they thought that only the God of Paul was uh the true god that's why they're called the paulicians so people are even ignorant about what these supposedly baptist groups uh believed the only similarity between some of these groups that are named for example in that book the trail of blood and us would be that they baptize adults that literally that, that right, the similarities right. end there most of that's these groups it. rejected uh the deity of christ and did not believe in the trinity so on and so forth but but so we 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 
we kind of like construct this view that is almost indistinguishable in many ways from Rome's view. We've always existed exactly as we exist today going back. And so we create our own version of that instead of just being, um, you know, kind of objective. Baptist perpetuity. Right, this Baptist perpetuity view. <laughs> instead of being objective and viewing the church fathers and the early church for what they were, which were Christians that were right on some things, wrong on other things. Right. And they were learning. Human beings. They were yeah. learning things. They didn't have the um, the advantages that we have today. Uh, of looking back at 2,000 years of church discourse and history, right? It's easy for you and me to say, well, that guy in the first century wasn't saved because he said something a little bit funny on justification. Well, how many things would you say funny on justification right. if you only had like one gospel, one letter of Paul, and maybe, you know, the, the book of First, uh, of first Peter or something like that? You'd say a lot of weird things on right. justification too. So the, the point being... While, while being persecuted, all the while being persecuted, we have this unrealistic idea of history. And one of the, you made a really good point here uh, just um, uh, unintentionally, and it was they're still not neutral when it comes to church history. Right. They act as if they, they don't want to talk about church history, but what they actually do is engage in revisionist history and, and an idea that can't be found anywhere. Right. And, and, and so that's why they loosely just say, oh, okay, the, uh, you know, the Paulicians, the Albigensians, yeah. all these groups. And then you look into them in reality, and you actually look at the facts, and many of the groups, not all of them, there are some, obviously, some Orthodox Christians that were outside of what was the, the Catholic Church at that time. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are complete heretics. Right. They deny the deity of Christ very often. You'll find you, they just want to point to anybody who's labeled as an Anabaptist. Right. Do you realize how many Anabaptists denied the deity of Christ? I mean, it was it was it's very common amongst those that were referred to Anabaptists, especially yeah. the farther back you go. Yeah. And uh but so every, they just want to they act as if, oh, you know, we don't I don't want to have anything to do with church history, but then they point to church history. It just shows again nobody's neutral. Right. It's impossible right. to be completely neutral in this. Right. And, and so I think and, and part of that is because they think that if, if in a, like I said, it's very similar to Rome's view that they we we fall into this thinking that if somebody hasn't agreed with everything I believe today all throughout history, then then that delegitimizes my view. Right? The same way that Rome gets her legitimacy from saying, well, everyone always believed exactly what we believe today. Well, here's the, the more balanced view is to say, no, perhaps not everyone agreed with me on every single point throughout history that I believe today, but that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm wrong, right? I should expect, in a way, to have better theology overall than somebody in the first century, right. uh, particu you know, particularly on other areas that are not theology proper and Christology, which is what they were always talking about and fighting over at, at that point, right? But other areas... I should expect to be, uh, you know, to have a more rich and a more, more accurate sound, yeah. theology than they did. And yet I could still say they were Christians. I could still look back right. and learn f things from them. And I would say particularly in this area of theology proper and Christology, I could still learn from them and, re and recognize they had shortcomings, but still recognize them as Christians. And so this is right. a much yeah. more balanced view. And I believe it's the true view of church history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's one of the points I was going to make. There, I think there's two flaws here. Number one is is arrogance and pride in that we struggle so much with with um, uh, having unity with someone that's a little bit different than us. Right. And and being able to say, hey, this guy is saved, although I don't agree with him on everything. Right. Right. I mean, um, you know, having a little bit of Christian character here, like we could be wrong about what are not the fundamentals of the faith. There are clearly those certain things that fall under what it means to actually be an Orthodox Christian, to be. A, and if you don't believe these things, you are outside of the Christian faith. Right. But we can differ on peripheral matters, e even even That's on okay. important matters like baptism, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say important matters. Yet yeah, we can we can have disagreements to a degree with those things. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, obviously there's a point to where they become, okay, this is fundamental. But yeah, still the, the essence of what, what we're both saying is exactly the same. Right. And uh, so it's the arrogance would be one of the flaws that Baptists have today, mm -hmm. which we're, that's a stereotype of Baptists. Right. And then just uh, independent Baptists, and I'm an independent Baptist, it's on steroids. Yeah. Right. It just takes another step up. It's, it's this pride and this arrogance, and we still do it today, of just wanting to separate ourselves from all other movements. Um, just uh, no discourse. Uh, in a very whatsoever. divisive. Yeah, no, we, yeah, we don't even want to have discourse. Right. We want to stay in our echo chamber and, and preach in a very divisive manner right. against 
all other denominations, all other forms of Christianity. And I'm not saying you shouldn't call out some of these, but there's there's um, a point at which it, when it become it comes into an arrogance, a pride, where we puff ourselves up, we're better than everyone else. Right. And, and actually, that's it, the first. If you problem. look at the 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 initial, you know, if you look at the origins of the Independent Baptist movement, this was not always the case. You had guys like no, John R. Rice holding tent revivals with Bob Jones, a Methodist. Um, yeah, Methodist and Presbyterians, and Presbyterians I mean, like Billy Sunday. Denomina- right. Yeah, yeah. Those were the three denom- denominations. Right. Those were the three that, fundamentalists. That, right. There was the the, the Baptist. Right. There was even the Reformed Baptist. Absolutely. Right. The, the Calvinistic leaning Baptist. Then there was Absolutely. the the Methodists and the Presbyterians, who are other types of Calvinists. And they they had their differences. Right. They fought on uh, on some points. They went to different churches, but ultimately they had right. discourse. They viewed each other as brethren. They acknowledged that these were Christian brethren. Right. They acknowledged as well, them right? as Christian brethren. It was a conversation brethren. within Christianity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. they were able so to learn from one another. And this pride. Right. And, and consequently, the independent Baptists of, of, of yesteryear, they had they their theological shor- uh, swords were much sharper than ours are today. Right. Oh, absolutely. Because they were constantly in discourse with these Methodists and with these Presbyterians and with these other people. They were, you know, having arguments, but with, you know, but friendly yeah. ones. But as a consequence yeah. of that, they knew the other person's position. Unlike today, like if you yeah, ask like your average independent Baptist what actually a Calvinist believes, it's going to be like a straw man fest. Right, right. Um, that was the, that was exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. So because of that, it, when we when you constantly misrepresent another position, um, obviously it makes it real easy. It's the straw man that you set up to knock down. But you know what? It also causes you to not fix some maybe small little minor errors, maybe even major errors that you didn't realize because you've been straw manning this position. Maybe that's actually the correct position. Right. And because you were misrepresenting it, you weren't aware that you're wrong on whatever this particular topic may be. So you can see the benefit of actually having conversation, listening to the other right. the other side, seeing what it is that they actually believe. And uh, you know, uh, the only reason that we wouldn't cuz we're t- we are to engage with ideologies. We shouldn't be afraid of listening to someone about about church history, about uh, someone theologically today that we differ with. We should be willing to challenge our own views, our own positions on things. And we should be able to critically think. Right. right. The only reason why someone wouldn't is because they're they're afraid. They're scared, like you said, about looking into church history, and then they realize that uh, you know it's not as. And this gets to the second point of of the error that we make that it's not as clean right. and as black and white as I want it to be. That's not what church history is like. Right. So they can try to make the trail of blood like the Roman Catholic. You know this doctrine of uh, of uh, perpetuity mm-hmm. that it's just it's per- this perpetual line that you can trace down. They could try to make it out as if it's clean, and nice and clean, and and just black and white, but it's it's messy. It's messy, very because messy. We're sinners. I mean, we live in a fallen world. Uh, we're erroneous. We 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 are wrong about things, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's what we should expect. And they had more challenges and factors um, at that time, like you pointed out. So we should expect that they they grew our Christian heritage and history was a struggle where our brethren were growing. It's the faith of our fathers, and they were growing and learning as time went on, and we should benefit from that. Absolutely. Instead of disconnecting ourselves, creating a fantasy that, you know, these are all, you know, these particular Christians are the only Christians, or a fantasy. Some people are just like, you know, they're out in the mountains. We don't have their writings. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah, you know, know, there's these groups. We don't really know, but— you know, we know they, they had existed. to be there, right? It's like, come on, they had to be there, right. right? It's like, it's not reality, right? And I would say that you can even still believe that without discounting the mainstream Christians that we know of, right? You, yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure some existed, right? Some, right. all right, I, I, right, you know, exactly, probability, right? I'm, I'm, I'm. I believe that there had to be someone who probably might have agreed almost exactly with what I believe today, right? But I'm not, but that was not exactly. I wouldn't say it's commonplace, or there was like whole communities of them <laughs> existing in the mountains. But but yeah, of you know, really, what I was what I was getting at was that it's like this consistent clean line, and they were always out in right, the mountains. Right, exactly. You could always find them. It's messy. Right. There's people disagreeing with the the established church at that time. The majority of what would be Christianity. And they're going in and out of the church, right. and there's new, air, you know, different areas of disagreement where Christians are persecuted for this, that. It's messy over different issues. Yep. 
Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that's a that's a that really is um I completely agree. That's the core of the problem mm-hmm. of um of independent Baptist today. Um it is that we've rejected theology, the 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 topic of theology and because of that we we've cut ourselves off and we're not able to learn from other people as we should. Right. Right. We're not able to learn from the mistakes of the past. And you say, "Well, I, you know, the topic of theology is boring. I don't do th- theology. Pastors making comments like that. No, you're going to do theology either way. Everyone you're either going to do it everyone poorly does it. or you're going to do it well. Right. Everyone's a theologian. And, right. The, the, the question absolutely. is not, not whether you're a theologian. It's which type of theologian you're going to be. A responsible one right, or an irresponsible right. one that's ignorant. <laughs> Right, exactly. That's that. Yeah. So, um, you know, we if we have a view, and, and and all theology is is it's just a systematized way for us to have terms, to be able to have discourse, to be able to say, hey, you know, what is your position? Everybody wants to try to have a consistent interpretation of scripture, right. systematic theology. Right. So you say, well, I'm covenant, you know, theology or whatever term you use. I'm dispensational. That's a type of theology. Right. Correct. And this gets hashed out, right? And everyone, you know, has a theology, as yeah, as as we said. So um, there's no way to totally get away from it. And what we've done as Baptists is we've attempted in and in and it is again, it's it's an arrogancy, it's a pride to get away from that. Mm-hmm. And we just, as you put it, I've, I've never even thought of it in those terms. It's it's a way of just like being hyper sola scriptura, mm-hmm. of just saying, hey, it's just. The Bible is completely and only my authority. Right. As if uh, Christ did not promise to build his which, church uh, and that the gates of El would not prevail against it. Right. We want, we like to see ourselves right. almost like the first generation of Christians when in reality right. there's always been Christians on the earth. And it, it would we would be wise to learn from them. Right. Obviously, um, the Bible is our final our authority. Our Bible is our final authority. It's our ultimate and ultimate authority. authority. That's, but it's not to say it's our only yeah. authority. We have pastors yeah, and teachers, and, and that's essentially right. how I view church history. I'm looking at the writings of another pastor and another teacher, right? That, that That's all that it that's is. That's all that yeah. it is. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Just like uh, we have the Old Testament given to us to be a foundation for us to learn, to continue to learn, we have thoughts that are built out, and they get the, and they, they, they expand and they grow as time goes on. Mm-hmm. We learn more and more on those things. Well, that's what we have church history for. Right. Christ came, the cornerstone is laid, mm-hmm. we have the New Testament— yeah, you know, we have the apostles, we have the the prophets, teachers, and we have church history, all of our Christian brethren that we can learn from in the past and also our Christian brethren that we can learn from today. Right. The, Absolutely. The only we, distinction would be that the history is fallible. Our minds. Absolutely. Yeah. The history is fallible. The Bible is our ultimate or final authority. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's just like any pastor today. We all we already understand that. Right. Uh it's just like in another context. You know, we're just we're just triggered. Oh, that's you know, church history. Right. You can't have any of that. But we we understand that even in a, it, it, you you know what you do? You treat church history just like you treat church when you go in to listen to a pastor preach. Right. Right. It's the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Um. So what what we're doing is it it actually it does fall under the category of of sin, and that's that the really the the ultimate commandment that we should be striving to 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 keep every day is to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. But Christ in the New Testament, he adds to that all of our mind. Our mind. Because the essence of the commandment itself is to love him with everything that we have. Right. And a part of who we are, we we're, our strength, yes, we need to labor for him, preach the gospel, go door to door, whatever work that there is to do at the church. We need to love him with the strength that God has given us. And we may all have differing strengths depending on our ages, depending on you know uh, whether we're younger, we're older, disabilities, whatever it may be. But whatever strength God's given us, we love him with that to the, to our best, to, the, to the best of our ability. We love him with our heart, with all of our emotions, but we also need to love him with our mind. Amen. And you, as you aptly pointed out there, um, what we oftentimes fail to do is mm-hmm. when we say— intellectualism is dangerous. I want nothing to do with intellectualism. That's not to say there aren't people within what would be the, that, that corner of intellectualism that are wrong. Hey, we look at that and we analyze that critically through Scripture. Amen. Yeah. Right? As our ultimate authority. Right. We're not afraid to read it or see it or, you know, we don't, we're not afraid of it. Right. We, you know, 
what we are to strive to do. Because a lot of people use that as kind of this um, this th- this card that they throw on the table, when really what they're doing is they're failing to love God with their mind. Right. Yeah, they're you know our intellect. Right. They're failing to love God with their mind. We're not studying like we should study, right. and because of that, our 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 language fail is failing. We're ignorant of church history. We're ignorant of what different Christians believe today. Mm-hmm. We're not prepared for the discourse. Right, and um, right, we have that. And th- these issues of the Trinity today, these controversies, just are. A perfect example, perfect example of why yeah. we need to know church history, why we need to know theology. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why it's so important. Brother Gian, I appreciate it, man. This was take two, uh, obviously, so we had a little bit of trouble the first time around. Uh, but I would like to have you on a, uh, uh, in the future again for a, uh, a discussion uh, when it comes to – I'd like to – this was to help people in the historical. Right. Uh, angle, right? Because th- this is a, a problem. It's a root of a part of the issue. Right. Um, yeah, but I, w- I want to kind of prepare something where we just we go back and forth biblically, yeah. And we just we 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 give just all the supporting proofs for hey, let's look at maybe something that seems like a feat to someone, mm-hmm. like divine simplicity, and then help people to realize, hey, I actually believe divine simplicity right. in some terms. I just didn't have a name for yeah. it, right? So you do theology, you just don't know it, right? Yeah, exactly. As, as we were saying, right. people do that, yeah. So. Um, I'd like to have you on again to do that, and uh, we might have a, a little bonus interview, like like I alluded to earlier, uh, with you in the studio. Yeah, we can, I might take we can break over. Into I might the uh, crash the studio. You're right, and, and That'd not be so cool, distant man. future. Crash it. Yes, sir. Well, cool, man. I really appreciate it, brother Gian. God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Pastor. I'm honored to be the first uh, to uh, to not uh, to be um, the inaugural um, interview of your podcast. Right. Right. Yeah, the inaugural guest. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right, man. God bless you. Thank you very much, Brother Gian. Take care, Pastor Baker.